Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Priscilla Rojas and I'm the chair of the BPDA board. Thank you for joining the April 11, 2024 Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 26, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962. It's also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. So to begin the meeting, I'll take a roll call. Uh, Ms. Bennett? Here. Mr. Shepard? Present. Okay. And I, the chair, am present. Okay, let's go for EDIC agenda item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the March 14th, 2024 board meeting. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to amend the lease agreement with Droplet Incorporated. Uh, remove suite 503 from the lease premise at 12 Channel Street in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park, extend the lease term to March 31st, 2028, and settle outstanding debt. Maureen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Droplet is a medical skin care company and has been attended at 12 Channel Street since 2021. They occupy suites 601, 602, and 503 for a combined total of 17,967 square feet. Suite 503 is in raw condition with no air conditioning system. Suite 601 and 602 have been combined into a single suite and Droplet has spent over $1 million in tenant improvements. Droplet, is, Droplet has struggled recently due to less than forecasted new online sales of their product and the recent struggles have resulted in a rental arrearage owed to BPDA of $297,750. Staff believes that the business terms recommended are in a financial best interest of BPDA, but equally important, also assist a small startup company to stay in business with the full expectation of rebound and growth. The lease term for suites 503, 601, and 602 currently end January 30th, 2026 with the single two-year extension option. BPDA staff recommends that suite 503 be removed from the leased premises entirely. BPDA staff is confident the space will be rented by a new or existing 12 channel street tenant. Droplet will continue to occupy suites 601 and 602, and they will enter into a four-year commitment, which is one year longer than their current commitment at current market rates starting at $23.15 per square foot. That rental rate will increase annually by $1 per square foot. Regarding the arrears, staff recommends that the deferred rent owed be reduced by 35% and added to the monthly payments of the extended lease term. The reduced rent, rent reduced debt, excuse me, now $193,544 will be paid as additional rent in equal monthly installments. The business terms of the proposed lease amendment will result in a present value of approximately $1 million in BPDA standard metrics. When compared to the present value of the previous business terms, the proposed lease amendment results in a 30% increase in value to BPDA because of the extended term while also helping a small startup company succeed in Boston. Staff recommends that the director be authorized to enter into a lease agreement, a lease amendment with Droplet to remove suite 503 from the lease premises, extend the lease term, and settle outstanding debt related to occupancy at 12 Channel Street. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Maureen, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number three, request authorization to execute a memorandum of agreement with the City of Boston, acting by and through its Department of Public Works, authorizing the use and payment for fuel and services provided by the Fleet Maintenance Unit for the period from July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. 
at a total cost not to exceed $250,000. Lauren. Madam Chairman, members of the board, the City of Boston Department of Public Works, DPW, owns and operates a fleet maintenance unit which provides fuel and various vehicle services for city-owned vehicles. To achieve efficiency and decrease costs and expenses, the DPW has agreed to provide the BPDA use of the fleet maintenance unit. Services under the fleet maintenance unit will be provided to all entities under the BPDA, including the Boston Redevelopment Authority and the, and the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston including the Office of Workforce Development. Services under the fleet maintenance unit include gasoline and diesel fuel, emergency breakdown response and towing, Massachusetts motor vehicle emissions and safety inspections, and repair and services at BPDA request as contracted at DPW city rates. The applicable rates for these services will be specified in an MOA between the Public Works Department and the BPDA. In addition, the city's DPW fleet maintenance unit shall also provide the BPDA with the following services at no additional charge in keeping with past practice. Surfacing the, of BPDA vehicles, transfer services of vehicles between city agencies and BPDA and vice versa, and inclusion in the city of Boston fleet management meetings and initiatives. For the purposes of efficiency and decreased costs and expenses, the fleet maintenance unit uh, requests for the fiscal year for 2025 or until June 30th, 2025. The total cost of services authorized for all BPDA entities under this MOA shall not exceed $250,000 funded through the BPDA fiscal year 25 operating budget. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. A moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Dr. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, okay, item number, item number four, request authorization to award final designation status to 22 Dry Dock LLC, a joint venture between related Beal, Boston Real Estate Investment Fund, and Kavanaugh Advisory Group for the long-term lease and redevelopment of the BIC owned 20 and 22 Dry Dock Avenue site located within the Raymond Elfland Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In April of 2021, BPD issued a request for proposals for 20 Dry Dock Avenue and 22 Dry Dock Avenue. Uh, there were two buildings comprised on a land area of approximately 80,000 square feet. Proposals were received in July of 2021. Um, as you stated uh, with the introduction, the partnership between Related Deal, Boston Real Estate Investment Fund, and Kavanaugh Advisory Group, henceforth in this presentation known as 22 Dry Dock LLC, uh, were awarded tentative designation in April of 2022. Their intent is to develop a 337,000 square foot life science building uh, to suit, uh, build a suit facility for Vertex Pharmaceuticals. The designation was last extended in October of 2023. Since then, the developer has received Article 80 approval. Uh, we've negotiated the ground lease to final form, um, uh, submitted Chapter 91 license to the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we've received approval for, they've received approval for final plans from BPDA, uh, completed abatement of all hazardous materials and have since demolished the buildings. And uh, they've relocated major utilities across the site and have submitted building plans to ISD and have also obtained uh, commitments for all necessary financing. Regarding the financing, uh, prestigious commercial real estate firm Colliers International stated in their 2023 uh, uh, fourth quarter life science market report that the demand for life science space in Boston is extremely low with several millions of square feet on the market for lease uh, or sublease. Um, that as well as construction costs and interest rates remain very high and both the debt and equity markets are very cautious about financing uh, flat developments right now. I think it's, it's virtually impossible to get them financed. While I'm not privy to every conversation between 22 Dry Dock LLC and their equity partners or lenders, I feel confident that one reason 22 Dry Dock LLC was able to obtain the financing is they have a 15-year lease commitment from a financially solvent life science tenant. Um, as I said, it's literally a build-to-suit opportunity. However, the economics of the development remain tight. 
Um, we're proposing a slight reduction in rent to BPDA from the initially proposed $20 per square foot of building area upon stabilization, uh, reducing that to $18 per square foot of building area. So the annual stabilized rent to BPDA will decrease by 10%. While that may sound generous on BPDA's part, the initial bid lease rate of $20 per square foot equates to a fee simple value of approximately $400 per square foot of building area. I personally track the life science land market closely and can attest that that is the highest per square foot rate ever paid in Boston for land for life science. The proposed new rate of $18 per square foot is between 40 and 60% higher than the current market rate, uh, which is based upon life science land appraisals that I have personally ordered since January 2024, and there's been three or four of them. Um, finally, so I think the economics are solid in, in BPA's favor as well. Um, and finally, many people on both sides of the table have worked very hard to get where we are today. The business negotiators, attorneys, permitting specialists, BPA development review on urban design, lenders, equity investors, senior management on both sides of the table, and of course the BPA board. On behalf of everyone involved, it's my sincere pleasure to recommend today to award final designation to 22 Dry Dock LLC. And I have absolute confidence that all the remaining milestones around financing will be met on or before July 31st of 2024. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Um, just quickly, Dennis, thank you so much for the uh, for that uh, uh, that context uh, and, and how to kind of view this this project within uh, what's happening in the in the life sciences industry. So uh, that was helpful. You're very welcome. Okay. So with that, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thanks, Dennis. Item number five, request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of the Cronin Group LLC for six months through October 31st, 2024, and to continue lease negotiations with the Cronin Group LLC for the long-term lease and redevelopment of 24 Dry Dock Avenue, located within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Dennis, you're on mute. mute. Yeah. Apology. There we go. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. BPDA issued a request for proposals uh, for the redevelopment of 24 Dry Dock in July of 2019. Uh, 24 Dry Dock is a vacant 30,000 square foot building located within the boundaries of the Boston Ship Repair Lease Premises area. Um, it was a, a unique partnership between BPDA and Boston Ship Repair, wherein the RFP required that the development be, uh, of course, consistent with the Raymond L. Flint Master Plan update and also support maritime development as a condition of the, of the award. Cronin Development uh, was uh, selected as a developer in January of 2020. Subsequently, uh, Cronin uh, purchased Boston Ship Repair Company and now owns, uh, controls the lease in the entire lease premises. Um, under the terms and conditions of the, the development of 24 Dry Dock, EDIC will be refunding 50% of the rent paid for the lease premises, up to $10 million, which would be used uh, specifically towards capital repairs and maintenance of the Boston Ship Repair Facility. That's an agreement that we had with Boston Ship Repair before Cronin purchased, and they were, Cronin was, was uh, ready, willing, and able to honor that. Um, Cronin will put the $10 million up front into an escrow account <clears throat> for distribution upon lease signing. Um, and they will be reimbursed over the uh, over time via the first 10 years of the lease for about approximately $1 million deduction in those 10 years, it, uh, it, uh, virtually lending us $10 million interest free up front. Um, the designation has been extended six times, the most recent in October 23, wherein the designation was extended through April of, of this year. Cronin's proposal is to develop a 235,000 square foot building consisting of, on six floors. Uh, maritime space in a cafe and general industrial on the first floor, uh, life science development on the upper five floors. Progress towards the final designation have been impressive. BPA issued a scoping determination for the project. Um, early utility and demolition packages have been approved, allowing uh, Cronin to start demolition of the building prior to the lease commencement. We've made considerable progress towards uh, negotiating from so I expect that to be ready to sign uh, in April, uh, May of the link, so we're almost there. Um, expect to finalize within the next few weeks in terms of conditions 
um, all the conditions of the lease that he said which are attached in the term she attached you to here too and um, Brown is also diligently pursuing securing the required financing in this very challenging capital environment which I spoke about in the previous presentation um, BPD staff will not be recommending final designation until final development plans are submitted and approved article 80 process is completed chapter 91 determination from DEP master plan update is, is being issued by the, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to allow us to update our master plan to increase the, the building uh, densities for FAR. And uh, building permits are ready for issuance. Um, both sides are spending considerable time moving through these challenges. Um, I spoke about the, the financing challenges earlier, so there, there, there's, there's a little hurry up and wait going on, like every other developer in the state um, or the, the, the Northeast. Um, however, there have been some positive developments. Uh, Cronin recently has shown additional good faith by agreeing to take on the liability of the existing underground storage tank on the site, uh, which in, uh, includes but not limited to paying for insurance pollution and environmental reporting and any actions that would be taken uh, going forward. The, the lease boundary would have been extended to cover the, what is now the underground storage tank in the future. Um, and Cronin uh, to show at our request, but also show some good faith has agreed to take it on now to relieve that, that burden from us. Um, and they will take it on uh, uh, early in the development process. And I'm pleased to report that the Commonwealth has recently issued its, chap its draft chapter 91 determination, or a certificate of written determination, it's called, and not an expert on it, so I can't add too much on that. Fortunately, we have a lot of colleagues who are very knowledgeable about it. Um, but it will require, it, it will permit Cronin to start um, uh, to pursue all the required permits. Um, as I understand, the, the uh, common period ends next week, at which point we expect the, the, the determination, determination to be final and, and, uh, and to, uh, committed. Um, we're requesting commission today to extend the tentative designation period through October 30th of 2024 to give them uh, Cronin another six months to continue their due diligence. I fully expect to have uh, uh, final lease negotiations. They said we're almost done. Uh, Crony should be well into the permitting uh, by that point. And they will pursue financing uh, as soon as possible. And we're opt optimistic that the markets will strengthen uh, over the next six months. They're, they're showing some signs of it now, but it's still, it's still early. Um, so that is the presentation. We are asking for an extension of the designation. And um, I thank you, and I'm going to go with question. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, exciting times at the dry dock. Uh, so, um, roll, oh, don't wait, wait. A motion is in order. <laughs> yes, so moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks so much, Dennis. Thank you all. All right, item number six. Request authorization to execute a contract with Teresa Rowland to provide technical assistance with program development for the Emerging Job Trainings Program in an amount not to exceed $95,850. Uh, Tatiana. Madam Chair, I don't see her on, so okay. let's skip it and see if okay. she joins before we adjourn or we'll just have to go next month. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Um, okay, moving on to item number seven, request authorization to issue an invitation for bids for the elevator maintenance, repair, and testing at BPDA-owned assets at 12 Channel Street and 12 Dry Dock Avenue parking garage within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Lauren. Thank you, Madam Chair President. The BPDA seeks authorization to solicit bids for elevator maintenance, repair, and testing within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. The scope of services will consist of furnishing all necessary labor, materials, equipment, transportation, and related services necessary to maintain, repair, and test elevators located at 12 Channel Street and 12 Dry Dock Ave, which is the Marine Park Garage Facility. An invitation for bids will be publicly advertised, advertised pursuant to sections 39F and 39K through 39P of Chapter 30 and Chapter 149, sections 29 and 44A through J of the Massachusetts General Laws, including advertising with local newspapers on the BPDA's website, the statewide wide combi system, including affirmative marketing to small, local, and diverse businesses. 
the awarded contract will be for a term of three years. Funding for this project will be from the BPDA's fiscal year 25 operating budget. The cost is not expected to succeed $350,000 for the three-year term. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard? And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. All right, and uh, uh, let's go to personnel. Uh, Mike. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. Uh, we have a number of items for your consideration on the EDIC agenda uh, with exact details that are included in the board memos. We have two contracts in the director's office, John Weil, and in the office of workforce development, Carville Blackwood. We have four internships slash co-ops in the IT department, Kristen Medina, in the human resources department, Matthew Callahan, in the planning department, Tejas Chakravathi, and in the development review department, Grace Fruya. We have seven out-of-state travel requests, and we have four departures. In the finance, um, in the finance department, Mario Morris, procurement specialist operations, Riley Barsamian, procurement specialist construction. In the research department, we have Matthew Wessinger, senior uh, researcher and economist, and Ethan McIntosh, research associate. And that's everything. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. No <laughs> moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, and welcome to uh, those four interns and, and co-ops. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, to hosting them. And uh, thank you, Mario, uh, Riley, Matthew, and Ethan for, for all your contributions um, as well. So thank you. Um, all right, uh, Secretary Plahimas, do we uh, do we have anyone to talk about item number six or? We do okay. not, so we're gonna skip it. And okay. Take, we'll, take we'll, it up we'll next month. It. Okay. Um, so with that, we finish the EDIC. So I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. <clears throat> motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Okay. Uh, now let's go over to the BPDA portion. So thank you for joining the April 11, 2024 Boston Redevelopment Authority Board Meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications, at Xfinity Channel 26, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. So I will uh, begin by taking a roll call of the members, Ms. Bennett. Present. Uh, Mr. Shepard. Present. And, uh, and the chair, Crystal Rojas, I'm present. Awesome. Let's go to agenda item number one. <clears throat> Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the March 14, 2024 board meeting. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on April 11, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the pro proposed development plan for plan development area number 154 located at 180 Western Avenue in Alston and a companion zoning map amendment. Uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. 
and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on April 11, 2024 at 5.40 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to uh, approve the seventh amendment to the master plan for the plan development area number 69, South Boston, the 100 acres. And to also approve the development plan for the uh, for 232A Street project within plan development area number 69. And to consider the uh, 232A Street project as a development impact project, a motion is in order. Okay. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number four, we have an informational life sciences update. Ruben, the floor is yours. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chair Rahas, members of the board, Secretary Polimus, Chief Jameson, thank you for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ruben Cantor. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for the BPDA, uh, and we understand the board has requested an update on where the BPDA stands uh, with uh, life science development. Next slide, please. So to summarize some of the topics that we wanted to address this afternoon really quickly, uh, you know, there have been questions about design uh, and siting as well as sustainability uh, issues. Uh, we understand people have a desire to better understand the public safety protocols that are in place related to research labs. We also are aware of the, the desire for more communication with the public about these types of issues. Um, this does seem like a good time to mention that we are actively working towards scheduling a public meeting focused on life science public safety, which we are targeting towards the end of May or early June. We hope to have something we can announce on that very soon. I know that's something that uh, that has been uh, pending for a little bit. Um, we have recently heard questions over the last few months about developers coming to the BPDA with lab projects, even during some of the, the market shifts that we've been seeing. So we'll share some information about that as well. Finally, the one topic we won't really address in much detail today is workforce, but I will just share for now that the Office of Workforce Development just recently announced $5 million in workforce grants to a number of area organizations, mostly nonprofits, to increase Boston resident access to life science training and employment opportunities. Um, so we've seen a number of recent lab projects as well, set aside dedicated training space to expand training within those city limits. Uh, so we'll just mention that on workforce. Next slide, please. So we have a group here prepared to talk about um, these key issues that have been raised in regard to development of life science. We'll have brief presentations from the BPDA's planning, urban design, research departments, as well as a presentation from the Boston Public Health Commission. We'll do our best to accomplish this as efficiently as possible. So with that, I'd like to go to the next slide and hand things over to Kathleen Onifer from the planning department. We can't hear you, Kathleen. Caught by the button. Uh, good evening, Chair Roja, Secretary Polhemis, Director Jemison, and members of the board. Kathleen Onifer with BPDA Planning and Zoning. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so to date, and this is a map prepared by our research department showing both existing and um, operating lab projects in the city. Those are shown in gray dots, um, as well as projects that are part of the development review pipeline. Um, whether those are projects that have filed a letter of intent in blue, are under review in yellow, are board approved projects in green, uh, and in magenta pink, um, pink and under construction. Um, what I think you can see from this uh, map is some clear clustering of where lab projects are located in the city um, and we'll walk through quickly both some of those key clusters as well as how that relates to both planning and regulatory regimes that we have next slide please um, as you can see, labs are concentrated in a few areas and districts of the city. Um, these are locations where we have major regional job centers, uh, like the South Boston waterfront. Um, there are areas um, like uh, you know, Fenway and Longwood, particularly where we're near existing labs and major institutional hubs. Uh, that are part of the life science and lab ecosystem. And many of them are also areas where we've done significant planning for formerly industrial land to help continue an employment base for the city in the 21st century economy. Uh, and so that includes planning that this agency has done over decades in the South Boston waterfront, uh, both through the 100 acres uh, effort, as well as specifically in the Ray Flynn Marine Park. Um, in the South End Harrison Albany corridor, um, right, looking at uh, industrial land there that you see here. 
um, as well as in Alston Brighton uh, and how that relates to the emerging activity of Harvard in uh, Alston Brighton as an institution. Uh, from a zoning perspective, these are also uh, correlated not just uh, with industrial land because uh, research laboratory was considered part of industrial uses until last year uh, when we brought before you a zoning amendment that created its own definition of land use for research laboratory. Uh, that was done in order to enable clear assessment of linkage uh, that treated research lab as a different use. It also allowed us to build this into our land use planning framework in a more targeted and effective way. Um, so now as we are updating and planning for labs across the city, uh, right, we see that labs are allowed in zoning through either institutional right, master plans or institutional zoning processes. In some locations through industrial zoning where both what previously was an allowed use and continues, um, as well as through plan development areas, which is one of the primary pathways that we see the entitlement of lab projects. Next slide, please. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Seth Reisman at uh, our urban design department to walk through some of the ways that we approach, particularly in the plan development area process and with the unique concerns of labs. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas and Chief Jemison. My name is Seth Reisman, Deputy Director of Design Review at the BPDA. Next slide, please. As part of the city's comprehensive efforts to plan for the lab building type, the BPDA is in the process of developing design guidelines for life science buildings. The guidelines aim to make sure that projects achieve a respectful fit for their site and surrounding community, help activate and enhance the mixed use environments that they are typically located in, allow for flexibility in design critical to the success of this use type, and support citywide planning goals, including resiliency, sustainability, equity, and affordability. The guidelines are meant to be a resource for both developers and community members as projects are being designed and go through the entitlement process. Next slide, please. The guidelines are meant to address only a subset of the concerns uh, that Ruben articulated earlier, specifically urban design, resiliency, and sustainability. Next slide, please. The guidelines will be used by the BPDA, other city agencies, developers, architects, and the community uh, as uh, projects are evaluated. The guidelines will provide guidance on citywide design and performance goals for lab development. They are complementary to existing neighborhood plans, existing zoning and regulations. They do not supersede them. Consistency with these guidelines is distinct from other city review processes such as the Boston Civic Design Commission and the Public Improvements Commission. Next slide, please. The guidelines are focused on holistically addressing the specific design challenges of this building type, including floor plates and massing, mechanical equipment, ground floor, loading, servicing, and active uses, transportation, and sustainability and resiliency. Next slide, please. The draft guidelines were developed with input from community members, design professionals, and developers. The first draft was released about a year ago and has been tested now over on a dozen projects. We are currently evaluating the results of this beta test, including another round of stakeholder engagement before creating a revised draft for review and potential adoption. More information about the guidelines can be found on the BPDA website under development standards within the development heading. And now I would like to hand it over to PJ McCann uh, at the Boston Public Health Commission. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rojas, members of the board, and Chief Jemison for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. I'm PJ McCann, and I currently serve as the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the Boston Public Health Commission. Our biosafety program is uh, among the, the programs that I support. Uh, next slide, please. So here again, we see that in addition to the clustering of laboratory space in general, the seven labs that conduct research at biosafety levels three and four are clustered in, those are in the yellow here. And these are clustered in three areas, Longwood, the BU Medical Campus, and Tufts. These, uh, level two and level three labs are all operated by these level four and level three labs are all operated
operated by hospitals and universities. In addition to the level three and level two labs, BPHC permits 86 total labs under the local board of health regulations. Next slide. So you can see here from this slide that I borrowed from the BPDA that land use review and permitting is only one part of a comprehensive set of rigorous uh, federal, state, and city regulations for life sciences development. These levels of oversight are mutually reinforcing and the layers of regulation are appropriate to ensure that the appropriate protections are in place in each lab. Uh, next slide. So just for a bit of background on our regulatory framework, uh, Boston has a long history of local regulation of biological laboratory research dating back to a 1981 city ordinance requiring local permitting of all recombinant DNA work in the city. And since BPHC was created in 1986, it has assumed responsibility for regulating our DNA work. And in 2006, our Board of Health passed the biological laboratory regulation that added comprehensive permitting and oversight of all labs conducting research at biosafety's level, biosafety levels three and four, in addition to continued oversight of recombinant DNA research. Next slide, please. So just for a bit more background on additional level of oversight at uh, the BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs and sort of the rationale for that. BPHC's permitting requirements are aligned with the relative level of risk associated with each class of laboratory type, and they help to ensure compliance with state and federal standards and guidelines. The CDC classifies biosafety levels ranging from level one to level four, corresponding to the level of risk associated with the organisms that are being studied and the safety protocol, protocols under which they are required to operate. And again, most labs in Boston are classified at level one or level two for work involving known agents that pose minimal to moderate risk to the laboratory personnel, the public, and the environment. Level three work, on the other hand, can involve diseases that may cause serious death or lethal infection, and level four work can involve diseases that may cause serious or lethal infection with no treatment readily available. So this is why we apply more scrutiny to this smaller subset of labs and leverage the expertise of experts in the field and community members in reviewing applications for these labs. Next slide, please. So just before I close, I did want to say a bit about sort of the, the support that we get in, uh, in doing this work. From the beginning of the local regulation of labs in Boston over 40 years ago, transparency and community engagement have been an important part of our regulatory framework. First, our regulations are adopted and amended through a public process, including public hearing, written comment, and vote of the Board of Health in an open meeting. Um, the Boston Biosafety Committee was created by these regulations and serves as an advisory body for this work. It advises BPHC on lab research and project approval decisions, as well as regulatory and policy matters. It, include, it includes, again, leaders in the field, as well as community members. And again, these meetings are also open to the public. In addition, the labs we regulate are required to have their own institutional biosafety committees, uh, which have meetings uh, and are required to hold open community meetings as well. Uh, we also con convene a Boston Biosafety Working Group to ensure coordination and information sharing across agencies. So we welcome the opportunity to work in closer collaboration with BPDA and other agencies that help to ensure uh, safety and life sciences work in Boston. And now I will pass it to Christina Kim uh, for the next segment of the presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, Christina Kim, Deputy Director of the Research Division at the BPDA. I'm going to talk a little bit about the life science real estate market and development trends in Boston. Next slide, please. Here you can see that um, Boston Cambridge metro area is really a national leader in the area of, of life science research. And that is shown in the amount of research lab space that we have in the area. These are data from CBRE looking at the commercial lab space that they track, so not necessarily including all of the lab space that is in university and college campuses. But you can see um, there is 55, um, 
55 million square feet of uh, life science lab space inventory in commercial labs in the Boston Cambridge metro area, much more than the next two largest areas in the country in San Francisco and San Diego metros. And in terms of what's under construction, about 12 million square feet, Boston Cambridge, and um, eight and four million in San Francisco, San Diego. Next slide, please. Looking at the commercial lab inventory in Boston, we can see a, a very rapid increase over the past four years, but not all of that space has been filled and, and occupied as of yet. So the dark blue is what is, what is currently occupied. The light blue is, is available but not vacant. That might be um, still under construction, having some future availability. It might be available for sublease. And then the red is um, physically vacant and uh, immediately available. So we do see some, with so much inventory coming online, we do see some um, availability and vacancy. Next slide, please. Um, here, this looks at that vacancy as a rate and then also with the average asking uh, rents, which have um, stabilized and even gone down slightly at the um, recent quarters. So we're up to, in quarter one, 2024, 12% vacancy, according to CBRE in those uh, commercial labs, although that was a tentative number. Next slide, please. So this is for quarter four, 2023, so the quarter previous, um, looking at uh, uh, city of Boston compared to other cities around um, and metro areas around the country and our vacancy rate was relatively low compared to other areas. We didn't have um, quarter one 2024 for the other areas yet and so we'll have to take a look how our 12% compares with those other areas when that becomes available. Next slide please. Um, looking at approvals and permitting of labs since 2020. So um, a lot of lab approvals have, have come through our agency. Um, that's in the, the aqua color there. And then a, a lower number of um, square footage in life, life science lab space that has gotten construction permits each year. And that number has been um, lower um, this year. Next slide, please. It's sort of in terms of the stock of the pipeline here, we have uh, about uh, 6 million square feet that's under review in projects, uh, about 12 million square feet that is board approved, uh, about 5 million under construction, and, and just very little that was actually completed in, in the past year. Uh, next slide, please. However, looking at the funding for life science research, definitely the Boston Metro receives significant both public and private investment for life science research. You can see the graph here. Uh, the dark blue is, is uh, venture capital funding. The aqua is uh, NIH, um, National Institutes of Health funding to, to the area. Um, the city of Boston is uh, always number one or number two for cities in the country um, in National Institutes of Health funding. So there is a lot of investment and so a lot of reason to think that the inventory will be able to um, be absorbed um, as the real estate market stabilizes. And I believe this is my last slide, so I think we're passing back to Ruben. Thanks, Christina. So with that, first of all, my gratitude to, to Kathleen, Seth, PJ, and Christina for, uh, for uh, that, that presentation. One thing I did want to mention on the issue of public safety is we did take a look at the mayor's budget that came out this week, and there's an expansion in the fire department of the, um, the research lab um, inspections unit. So we're very pleased uh, to see that. So that's the only addition to, that I wanted to make to, to PJ's uh, presentation. And with that, are we here to answer your questions or hear your thoughts? Great, thank you so much. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Just thank you, that was super helpful. And if we could, if we could um, get the presentation, I, you know, circulate or tell us where on the website it is, that would be great, thank you. Uh, I agree with that. It was definitely informative, uh, especially the levels 
uh, something I don't keep in mind when uh, we have public meetings and people talking about certain things. So thank you very much. Yeah, great. It was really good to see all, um, you know, uh, to see all the different agencies and groups of people that are involved and, uh, and their particular uh, focus area. So um, again, great job. I know I've been, um, uh, you know, asking for <laughs> uh, but this is exactly what, like, exactly what I wanted to hear, exactly what, um, or just the type of information, right? This answered a ton of questions for me and uh, it's just, very, you know, very well done. Um, so, so thank you. Um, question on um, communication campaign, right? Do we have a communication strategy or, uh, you know, planned campaign of, uh, you know, how we make this information um, known and, and accessible? Thank you for that question, uh, Chair Ross. Um, we have not put together a strategy uh, as of yet, but, um, but it's a really great question. I think it's something um, that we'll start to work with our communication staff as well as those uh, BPHC and elsewhere um, to figure out what we want and, and how especially we're going to plan that, that life science public meeting um, and, uh, and, and that part. And PG, I don't know if you want to address if there's a communication strategy you want to talk about on your end. No, I would just add that I think it would be important to show the public that uh, that it is a, a broad range of agencies working together. So I think if there is one, I think it would be great if it, it involves us by our uh, as well as others. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, the, the circle bubble slide with the, <laughs> the circle and all the different bubbles. Um, uh, but but it, it it gives that um, I know there's a there's a lot of uh, groups involved, but it um, and I think kind of creates or um, it communicates all the attention right that does that you know that different people and different groups are um, are paying uh, um, to uh, the. You know, again, common questions like what happens if there's a fire? What happens if there is? You know, um, so. Uh, again, I think we've we've done a really great job, or you've done a really great job of, of summarizing and getting that together. Just you know, highly recommend to you, um, you know uh, to think about your communication strategy. You know, I think the public meeting that is coming up, I think that you know that's good for the focus area and kind of see, uh, yeah, start kind of testing something out and uh, um, yeah, uh, from a uh, you know. The TikToks and the Instagrams, <laughs> um, but they're they're really, uh, you, you know, these are just great slides and great visuals to be able to like, okay, clear, I got the message, right? Like in a relatively short amount of time. I don't know if you guys like, you know, timed that or, <laughs> or whatever, but it was you know really great and easy to digest and understand, as well as um, the language that you're using as well of accessible language um, and kind of not getting to. Um, to jargony, right? Or assuming that people know what all those letters mean. Um, we all have like an acronym, acronym soup in our heads usually from like work. So, um, so yeah. So again, just just kudos. You know, wanted to, to call out um, those specific areas. Very excited to uh, you know to that we have this information, um, and you guys have just done a, a really great job. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, so this is just an informational update, so no vote is to be taken. Um, again, thank you so much. Appreciate your collaboration and, and coordination. Thank you. Cheers, cheers. All right, item number five. Request authorization to execute a memorandum of agreement with the City of Boston acting by and through its Department of Public Works, authorizing the, the use and payment for fuel service, fuel and services provided by the fleet maintenance unit for the period from July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025 at a total cost not to exceed $250,000. Lauren. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, this is the same business agreement from the EDIC portion. I'm happy to summarize, although uh, uh, yeah, you I just did. Yeah, I was just like, do I have the right to do that? <laughs> yeah, I just read that thing. So uh, any additional questions or comments from the board on that? Okay, here again, seeing that a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you. 
Okay, item number six, request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of Asian Community Development Corporation as developer of parcel R-1 in the South Cove Urban Renewal Area, project number mass R-92, located at 055 and 57 Hudson Street, 052, 54, 56, and 58 Tyler Street, and 0 Holland Street in Chinatown for 12 months through April 30th, 2025. Emma. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. We're requesting board approval to extend the tentative designation status of Asian Community Development Corporation for the development and long-term ground lease of parcel R1 in the Chinatown neighborhood. Parcel R1 is an approximately 18,000 square foot site located in the South Cove urban renewal area. It's comprised of 14 contiguous assessors parcels of land bounded by Harvard Street to the south, Tyler Street to the west, Hudson Street to the east, and bordered to the north by the rear of 75 Neyland Street. After a robust community process, the BPDA issued an RFP for parcel R1 in August of 2021, with proposals due in October of 2021. Based on an extensive review and evaluation with the community, the proposal from Asian Community Development Corporation was selected as the most highly advantageous. Accordingly, in April of 2022, the BPDA board approved the tentative designation of Asian CDC for the redevelopment of parcel R1. In April of last year, the board extended the proponent's tentative designation status. The development team proposes a 12-story structure with 110 residential units, all of which are income restricted to a variety of income levels. The project will also add approximately 17,000 square feet of community use space for the Chinatown branch of the Boston Public Library. Since receiving its tentative designation extension in April of 2023, Asian CDC has received funding awards from the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, finalized and executed a TAPA with the Boston Transportation Department, and received approval from the Public Improvement Commission. During the requested 12-month extension, the development team plans to achieve the following to enable staff to recommend final designation. Continue negotiating a ground lease for the property with the BPDA. Continue negotiating a memorandum of understanding with the city with respect to the library space within the project. Bid for a general contractor, issue an RFP for tax credit equity, and close on construction financing. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll we'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, thanks, Emma. And we're really excited to see that project moving forward. I think that's just going to be so cool. So, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, item number seven. Request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of the Tenants Development Corporation for the development of a community center, including office space for its headquarters, on parcel 22A in the South End Urban Renewal Area, project number mass R-56, located at 151 Lenox Street in Roxbury, for three months until July 31st, 2024. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm requesting an additional three-month extension to the tentative designation for the Tenants Development Corporation for the redevelopment of BPDA-owned parcel 22A, located at 151 Lenox in the South End. The board originally awarded TDC tentative designation in June 2018 and has extended the designation several times since the original vote. TDC is proposing to develop a community center, including office space for its headquarters. Additional fundraising needs to be obtained in order to account for the rise in construction costs following the pandemic. As previously reported, TDC has committed $2.5 million and has obtained $1.4 million of other financial commitments towards this project. Since the last extension, they have committed um, an additional $2.5 million in equity towards the project's capital stack. To complete the remainder of the capital campaign, TDC and their financial consultant are pursuing funding through ARPA, philanthropic sources, and other community benefit funds. TDC then intends to close on new market tax credits and a conventional construction loan following the completion of the capital campaign. Securing the remainder of their financing would enable them to move towards finalizing construction drawings and into zoning and approvals process. 
TDC expects to use the three-month extension to work on an evaluation of the proposed program to identify if they can assemble the necessary financing to move the project forward or if the project needs to be reconsidered given the current market conditions. We expect to be back before you in three months to provide an update on the project status and any changes that may result from this analysis. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Uh, Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Natalie. And we're, you know, we're, we're rooting for, <laughs> rooting for the project. Uh, um, you know, best of luck to to, the, to our internal team and in, in helping us uh, um, support this de this developer and this this project. So, thank you. Yeah. Item number eight: requests authorization to extend the tentative designation status of Civico Development LLC and Dream Collaborative LLC for the lease and redevelopment of 555. 559 Columbia Road in the Upman's Corner area of Dorchester for 12 months until April 30th, 2025 to create affordable housing and a branch library for the Boston Public Library and to and enter into a lease, enter into lease negotiations with the redeveloper to facilitate the long-term lease and redevelopment of the site. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. 555 to 559 Columbia Road, also known as Site 1 in the Upham's Corner implementation process, is at the heart of the Upham's Corner District in Dorchester. The site consists of a parking lot with 17 parking spaces and a three-story masonry building built in 1915 for the Dorchester Trust Company. In April 2023, after a thorough review from the BPDA's real estate team, the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, the Mayor's Office of Housing, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Boston Public Library, in conjunction with the community, um, we recommended that the board award tentative designation status to Civico Development and Dream Collaborative. Civico and Dream have proposed a development that will be comprised of 33 all affordable home ownership units with AMIs ranging from 70 to 100%. On the ground floor, there will be nearly 20,000 square feet of space for a new branch of the Boston Public Library. The proposal was considered highly advantageous due to its exceptional design that was considerate of the architectural context of the neighborhood, the creation of 100% affordable home ownership units, and successful community engagement through the public process. During the past tentative designation period, the developers completed a site survey as well as, as, well as reviewed environmental due diligence materials. They have begun initial financing conversations with lenders and have engaged in numerous conversations regarding the site of the design, reviewing schematic designs alongside the Boston Public Library and the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, who oversee the adjacent Strand Theater. In the next 12 months, through this extension, Civico and Dream plan to complete the schematic designs, negotiate the ground lease with the BPDA, submit their project notification form, complete Article 80, and assemble project financing. It is therefore recommended that the board authorize a 12 month extension for a tentative designation. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number nine. Request authorization to award tentative designation to related Beale and Dream Development Dream Development for the redevelopment of 17 parcels known as the Boston Water and Sewer Commission parking lots in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury for 12 months until April 30th, 2025, and to execute a memorandum of understanding between the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, City of Boston, and the Boston, uh, Boston Water and Sewer Commission for the transference of six parcels owned by Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. The Boston Water and Sewer Commission parking lots property consists of five parking lots owned by Boston Water and Sewer and the adjacent vacant parcel owned by the BPDA, which together make up approximately 190,000 square feet of vacant land in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. The property is located directly across Harrison Street from the Boston Water and Sewer Commission Department Headquarters. The property was identified in the 2022 citywide land audit as a high priority site for redevelopment to help achieve the city's affordable housing creation goals. 
The Boston Water and Sewer Commission have been a tremendous partner in the disposition efforts, and a component of the vote tonight is to authorize the BPDA to enter into an MOU with Boston Water and Sewer and the City of Boston to further define the terms of the transfer of the property to enable redevelopment. As proposed, Boston Water and Sewer will transfer the northeasternmost parking lot as a phase one to the City of Boston for consideration, and the City will then subsequently transfer the property to the BPDA. The remaining parking lots will then be transferred from Boston Water and Sewer to the BPDA at such time when the city delivers a parking facility on Boston Water and Sewer owned parcel outside of the development to accommodate the relocation of the employee parking. The BPDA will be able to assign its rights to a development entity. It is expected that the phase one redevelopment of the property will leverage American Rescue Plan Act funds to make available through the Mayor's Office of Housing to develop home ownership units on that portion of the site. The BPDA and the Mayor's Office of Housing staff held five community meetings to draft the request for proposals for Boston Water and Sewer Commission parking lots to ensure that the property is a community-led development in action. The community stated that the RFP must seek proposals that address the need for affordable rental and home ownership creation, open space, more transparent or tr more transportation offerings, new community assets, services for community development, and ground floor activation. The RFP was released by the BPDA and MOH in December 2023 for the redevelopment of the property and the ability to access MOH funding resources for a project with significant affordable housing creation. On February 28, 2024, the BPDA and MOH received two proposals for the redevelopment of the property. Both proponent teams presented their proposals to the community in a virtual public meeting on March 19, 2024. The community was able to ask questions and provide feedback in both the meeting and through an online comment portal. Additionally, a project review committee was formed to evaluate the proposals in coordination with the BPDA and MOH staff. The PRC is an external group of nominated community stakeholders that provide the community perspective throughout the RFP evaluation process. All members of the Boston Water and Sewer Parking Lots PRC were residents and active members of the community. Following a thorough evaluation process, related BL and dream development proposal was deemed responsive and responsible and most advantageous. Through a majority vote, the community PRC voted in support of the related BL and dream development submission. The related BL and dream development proposal includes the creation of 402 residential units, 89% of which would become income restricted rental and home ownership opportunities. The proposal includes 79 home ownership units, 229 rental units, and 94 senior housing units. In addition to this housing, the team intends to create wealth building programs that would help renters become first time home buyers. This development would also include an acre of new green open space, ground floor spaces including retail, dining, community services, and incubator and startup spaces. The project will be designed as LEED Platinum with all electric buildings and with elevated floors to protect against flooding. The strength of the related Beal and Dream Development proposal include a range of affordability levels in the proposed housing program, the creation of significant quality open space, the consolidation of office parking on site, the quality of programming and assistance for small businesses on the ground floor, and the diversity and experience of the development team across all phases of development. I will now ask the related Beal and Dream Development to share more details about their proposal, and I'm happy to take any questions on the votes before you tonight once they conclude. Thank you, Natalie. Um, it's an incredible honor to be here today. Um, my name is Gregory Bynups. I'm the managing principal of Dream Development. I want to thank Madam Board Chair, members of the board, Secretary Palimas, Director Jameson, and the BPDA staff for your time today. Next slide. So before we give a brief uh, overview of the project, I want to give a quick introduction of our team members here with us today. From related to Beal, we have Kimberly Sherman Stamler, Dr. Aisha Miller, and Alex Provost from related to Beal. And from Gene Development, we have, of course, myself, John Virus, and Conan Harris. Next slide, Kim. My computer is just freezing. Is it back on? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, I want to share my thanks um, to everybody as well for the opportunity to develop this great site. We are thrilled um, and so excited to be here with you. I wanted to highlight on this slide the foundation of our proposal, um, our experience partnership, our commitment to affordable homes and sustainable design. 
our commitment to Roxbury, a robust DEI program, and our exceptional community benefits, all of which we'll talk about further in the presentation. I also want to touch on a few key points that related to and Dream Development are thrilled to be 50-50 partners on this project. Everything we do will be 50-50, planning, decisions, reviewing key components, and funding. I also want to highlight our team's commitment to Roxbury and to acknowledging and embracing the history of Roxbury throughout our entire development process and in the new development. And I also want to share our commitment to the community throughout our process to further inform design, programming, and our process itself. We're thrilled for the opportunity to, get, to engage, and we look forward to it. I'm now going to turn it to Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Kim. Next slide. So as, as Kim mentioned, our team you know, has experience and is committed to Roxbury, and that commitment spans several decades. Most recently, related to Bill was instrumental in establishing Benjamin Franklin's Cummins Tech, uh, which broke ground recently. In 2019, the community trusted us with developing the Helio site, and we're proud to say that we're going to be delivering affordable home ownership and rental and commercial space later this year. And now with this project, we're paying it forward, incubating new MWB businesses, hiring for this community, and mentoring the next generation. Next slide. So we have four key objectives for our proposal um, to deliver affordable home ownership and rental uh, homes uh, for families and seniors. 50% MBE ownership, as, as Kim uh, mentioned, and exceeding 50% MWB participation across our consultant team. We'll also engage in a robust community engagement process throughout the life cycle of the project. And lastly, we want to build wealth for Roxbury residents by converting affordable renters to homeowners. Next slide. John? Thanks, Greg. As Greg and Kim have already said, we're incredibly excited about our DEI program. It's robust and it's strong. As a son of Roxbury, I'm proud to be one of the owner developers on the team as part of the Dream Development Team and 50% ownership of this project. We're committed to over 50% of the project being firms that are women and minority owned, from the development team to operations to the consultant team to construction. We're going to work closely with our diversity consultant to make sure, in fact, that all of the employment opportunities are well known and communicated to local residents and that we are trying to hire as many Boston residents, women and minorities across the project. Now I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk about the program. Alex. Thanks, John. Next slide. So our team's program is centered around the collective goal of helping to solve the housing challenges currently facing the city of Boston with a heightened focus on affordability. It is financial tools like this RFP unlocking city-owned public land for public-private development that show our leaders are committed to finding solutions. Our vision maximizes the amount of financeable, income-restricted housing units that we could program on this site for a total of 402 residences, along with complementary retail and community space designed for this neighborhood. Of those 402 units, 79 units will be equitable home ownership opportunities for residents earning no more than 100% of area median income. 94 of those units are, will be in a dedicated building for seniors, allowing them to age in place with necessary support services. And the remaining 229 rental housing units will be weighted towards larger households, with 65% of those units being two, three, and four bedroom homes. Next slide, please. The site plan here shows several five to six story mid-rise buildings positioned around a new central green, a city block of green open space that will connect the site to the neighborhood and act as a destination not only for our residents, but for all of Roxbury. Phase one is intended to start construction in 2025 and includes the home ownership component of the project. Phase two, three, and four include the rental housing and our goal is to, to, to deliver all units by 2030. Next slide, and I'm gonna pass it back to John. Our home ownership program that you just heard from Alex on is central to how we plan to address the wealth disparities in our neighborhood. Central to that program are gonna be people and wealth creation. We will provide the services and focus those services on home ownership, converting affordable renters to first time home buyers, 
by connecting residents to community services, by providing them um, key opportunities to build assets, credit building programs for renters and owners, and in financial counseling, saving, and financial resources to provide them opportunities to buy. Hopefully, we'll have renters that become homeowners. We're super excited to work with the BPDA and all city and state agencies to try to make sure that there is an opportunity for home ownership to be a central part of this development. Now I'm gonna pass this on to Aisha. Thank you, John. Next slide. The external environment significantly impacts people's mobility, independence, and quality of life as they go about their daily lives. Next slide. A clean city with well-maintained recreational areas, ample rest areas, well-developed and safe pedestrian and building infrastructure, and a secure environment provides an ideal living environment for seniors to age in place and for families to build community. We are really, really excited about the possibilities of having bike and pedestrian zones, children's areas to play and courtyard, a senior garden to grow organic vegetables in a green space really for our quality living in Roxbury. Thank you. Next slide and I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Thanks. Thanks Aisha. So we're not only, not only prioritizing resident well-being through open space but also through high performance and resilient buildings. All electric, net zero, uh, net zero energy, passive house and lean certifiable. We're planting a host of new trees uh, as exemplified by the brand new central green um, in the center of the development to help reduce urban heat island impacts. Next slide, Conan. Hello everyone. Um, through the sustainability and design of our proposal, it will be green jobs for Roxbury and beyond. Franklin Cummins Tech new curriculum and campus is focused on sustainable green jobs. NECAP being on site, it will be open up for opportunity and workforce within the hospitality and tourism industry for some of our most vulnerable residents, our returning citizens coming home from incarceration. Through the community process, people have raised issues about making sure that we don't forget about the history of this parcel of land. As you can see with our proposal, we have not. Our team has talked with the likes of Kai Grant and Miss Alfreda Harris, who live close by the site and some others. We look forward to working with the local community to figure out how we can honor the families that were displaced. Next slide, John. Thanks, Conan. And as I close it out, hopefully, you know, Madam Chair and members of the board, you hear the excitement from the team. We're really excited to work with Director Jameson and the BPDA staff to work with the community and planning the rest of this out and, and taking this through the, prog prog the process. Um, we're also really honored to have the support of our district city councilor, state representative, and state senator. We look forward to engaging in your questions and discussing this project tonight. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to board uh, questioning, we do have um, a representative from Councilor um, Hernandez Anderson's uh, team. So, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Brutus, <laughs> Angie, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, apologies for the name. I, I took the link out of Councilor's calendar. Um, so uh, thank you to the chair and members of the board. My name is Angie. I'm representing Councilor Anderson. Um, Councilor, the Councilor appreciates the opportunity to address the board regarding this development and sends her support to the BWSC project by Dream Development and Related Bureau. Their focus on affordable housing, commitment to diversity, and transparent community engagement are commendable. She believes this project will positively impact the district and contribute to its growth and prosperity. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, great, so questions and comments from the board. Just uh, congratulations. This, it's great to see this moving and uh, with such a thoughtful and community-based proposal. Thank you. Yes, uh, congratulations to both Related Bill and Dream Development on the awarding of this parcel. Um, definitely can't wait to see it. Can't wait to 2025 to see phase one, hopefully in shovels on the ground. So let's get it done. Awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I've been uh, um, closely following this project and obviously the um, 
a great um, the size of this of this land, right? The um, the the opportunity um, to to do what you're doing is uh, it's just I'm very thankful. <laughs> I think um, uh, I thank you for working together um, in an authentic uh, and equitable way that came through. Um, and I can, you know, see and feel your, you know, your partnerships and your commitments, um, both on the related field side as well as stream development. So, um, uh, just awesome, awesome job on that. Um, and I, the intentionality by which you design this and thought about the entire ecosystem, as well as not just as it is now, but kind of taking that full, you know, let's recognize the history of what is there and what what we want to um, you know uh, how we can make a dent in repairing some of some of the harm right that that uh, that this um, this community has uh, has experienced um, and just creating this this level of affordability and this map in, in, in this uh, in this volume as well as you know understanding that you know there is a path to home ownership uh, and uh, and that's a it's it's a difficult uh, yeah I mean it's it's a, it's a lot of people's goal and dream uh, and I can just uh, see that this is an opportunity where um, yeah a lot of dreams are going to come true and like this is just serious like. The generational change and and the you know thoughtful way of the community and building like this has all of the um, all of the components and I'm just just super super excited very like supportive of uh, of what you guys are doing and uh, and the approach that you're taking um, and in listening to uh, to residents um, and being able to kind of point you you know talk about this problem here's how we're going to address it and that is a very clear that through line is there, um, and again, in an authentic um, and uh, uh, just in an in, in trusting way, right? Like you have built trust, right, within neighborhoods, within this board, within the you know people of the city, and that's not an easy thing to do, especially given you know our our history. So, um, yeah, this great example of what. Uh, what I know we can do, you know, when we when we work together, um, and you know, um, stick to our values. So, anyway, thank you. I believe uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepherd. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Good luck. We're rooting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Uh, item number 10. Request authorization to extend the tentative designation status of uh, Nuba LLC as developer of a portion of Parcel 8 located at Harrison Avenue and Washington Street in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury for six months to October 31st, 2024. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. This request is for a six month extension to the tentative designation for Nuba LLC for a portion of parcel eight located at Harrison Avenue and Washington Street, owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the city of Boston. As you may recall, the board originally voted to award Nuba LLC tentative designation on April 15th, 2021, and has extended that designation on October 13th, 2022, and again on April 13th, 2023. Nuba LLC is proposing to create approximately 110,000 gross square feet of residential space, which will include 114 all affordable units, consisting of 47 home ownership units and 67 rental units. Seven of those units will be live work units for Boston artists. There will be a ground floor commercial space offered to the National Center for Afro-American Arts Satellite Museum and a creation of a park at the corner of Melania Cass Boulevard and Washington Street. Since the last extension, Nuba LLC has made significant progress towards final designation. 
They've completed 100% of their construction drawings for NUBA apartments and NUBA homes and received comments from BPDA and MOH Design Review and Parks. NUBA apartments received a Massachusetts EOHLC Fall 2023 Mini Round Award for LIHTC and a $4.5 million subsidy and submitted a renewal request to the Boston Housing Authority for eight project-based vouchers. During the tentative designation extension period, NUOBA LLC plans to update the park concept, receive sign-off from the City of Boston Parks and Recreation, and submit a package to the City of Boston Public Improvement Commission, receive sign-off from M BPDA and MOH Design Review, Boston Landmarks Commission, DCAM, MHC, City Conservation Commission to sign the preservation and conservation restriction and negotiate the terms of the deed and land disposition agreement, which is anticipated to close in summer 2024. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number, oh, I lost my place. Um, item number 11. Request authorization to extend the tentative designation of Madison Trinity 2080, uh, yeah, of Madison Trinity 2085 development, uh, LLC, as a redevelopment, uh, as the redeveloper of 2085 Washington Street, parcel B, a portion of parcel 10 in the Roxbury uh, Strategic Master Plan for six months until October 31st, 2024, Natalie. Thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board. Parcel 10 is located in Roxbury near Nubian Square, adjacent to Melania Cass Boulevard and Washington Street. Earlier phases of Parcel 10 redevelopment included a grocery store, ground floor commercial retail space, and a mixed income residential units. Parcel B is the last remaining area of redevelopment on Parcel 10. The board originally voted to award Madison Tropical LLC tentative designation on May 15, 2012, and most recently extended the tentative designation for parcel 10B to Madison Trinity 2085 Development LLC on April 13, 2023. Madison Trinity is proposing to create approximately 112,000 gross square feet of residential space, which will include 96 residential units, of which 94 will be affordable. There will also be 2,000 2, square feet of community space with, within the 96 residential parking spaces and a below grade parking space garage. Since the last extension, Madison Trinity has been in mediation with the Abutter Tropical Foods regarding alleged impacts on the proposed project. Madison Trinity has continued to advance design improvements and construction budgets during this time. During the next tentative designation period, the redeveloper seeks to engage further in a mediation and resolution of the open litigation matters with Tropical Foods. Additionally, the redeveloper will advance the review of an approval of construction drawings and negotiated ground lease with the BPDA. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? I do have one, um, and not necessarily the specific, uh, the specific project, but, uh, I think we've done like five or six, and Natalie, I think you've probably done them all of the, uh, you know, requesting for, you know, for these extensions, um, uh, for these, these time periods. I guess just uh, how, um, is this a trend? Do we have, um, also kind of like what, what happens, right, if some of these really great projects that I'm excited for don't get financing? Like, how how does that how does that work? Um, if you know, and from a from a process from a time perspective, um, just. No, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I am actually new to this project. This was formerly Jonathan Short. So um, uh, I uh, just so there's some context. I'm always still learning. But uh, during the tentative designation processes, we always ask for phase budgets um, to be updated. So that's certainly something we're always willing to be engaged with the developer on and, and looking for um, updates and timelines that are associated with those changes if tentative designations are expected. Um, we we'll try to be as sympathetic as possible to market conditions and changes like that. And if there can be program changes, we're also um, open to having con 
conversations are around that within the realm of what was expected within the proposal. So um, it's a case by case sometimes, but um, it's definitely something we always look towards engaging on during tentative designation periods. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for, for sharing and uh, um, and for all the work that your teams that your teams do to um, again help help get these projects uh, over the line. So um, with that, uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair goes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Natalie. All right, item number 12. Request authorization to establish a demonstration project pursuant to General Laws Chapter 121B, Section 46F, and to adopt a demonstration project plan for the acquisition of, of the building and parcel located at 290 North Beacon Street in Austin, Brighton, consisting of approximately 47,607 square feet of land for redevelopment and acquire by quick claim deed the property of nominal consideration from IQHQ and to execute a purchase and sale agreement with IQHQ um, REIT and uh, to take all related actions. Natalie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, 290 North Beacon, located in Austin Brighton, abuts the Boston Housing Authority's Faneuil Gardens and McKinney Playground. The property currently consists of a 34,000 square foot one-story masonry and steel light industrial building situated on a 47,000 square foot parcel. The property is proposed to be transferred for a nominal fee to the BPDA as a community benefit resulting from the nearby redevelopment of 155 North Beacon Street into a life science campus totaling approximately 409,000 square feet. 155 North Beacon Street previously held a 40,000 square foot rehearsal and recording space provider for musicians within the greater Boston area. The developer of 155 North Beacon Street, IQHQ, has committed to transferring 290 North Beacon Street to the BPDA for a nominal fee to support the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture in mitigating against the widespread displacement of artists in that neighborhood. The BPDA has already received a site survey, phase one environmental, zoning analysis, and title report on the property. Additionally, the BPDA engaged with a consultant who has analyzed the potential redevelopment strategy of the property. The BPDA staff will do further environmental testing prior to redevelopment as a part of the site's due diligence. To acquire the property, the BPDA must adopt a demonstration project plan. BPDA staff have reviewed the conditions of the property and have confirmed that the property will require a full redevelopment to prevent blight and achieve higher and better use for the site. In order to prevent urban blight, the BPDA is interested in acquiring the property. It is therefore recommended that the BPDA proceed with acquiring the property by adopting a demonstration project plan and executing any and all related agreements and documents to support the acquisition, including the execution of a purchase and sale agreement and deed with IQHQ. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and saying that, motion is in order. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, thanks and great job, Natalie, that was a lot. Thank you, while. longest yet, no, I appreciate it, take care. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, item number 13, request authorization to execute a contract with Gel Studio Inc. for consultant services supporting preparation of the Boston's framework for greening while growing project for a term of up to 18 months and in an amount not to exceed $599,660. Um, Breeze. Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. Um, I'm Breeze Outlaw, urban designer at the, uh, in the urban design department. I'm here today on behalf of the department and Chief Deputy Chief of Urban Design, Diana Fernandez, to request authorization to award and enter into a contact for consulting services with Gale Studio Inc. for the Boston's framework for green and wild growing. Next slide. In December 2023, the board authorized the secretary to advertise and issue a request for proposal. Um, the project will create a comprehensive spatial and topological framework 
for the city's open space network by studying publicly protected open spaces and anticipated development of privately owned publicly accessible open spaces. Next slide. The primary goals of this plan is to create the comprehensive plan that stitches together the city's open space network of publicly owned, publicly accessible open space with the privately owned publicly accessible spaces to support growth and the creation of high quality open spaces that are inclusive, equitable, resilient, and accessible. Some of the uh, objectives that we intend to achieve include collaboration with the Parks Department, um, leveraging the open space and recreation plan that they've since uh, released last in, in 2023. Um, also to leverage the BPA growth projections and some of the key findings from the Boston Design Vision, um, as well as to address some of the inherent challenges to creating open spaces, whether that be from a public um, agency point of view or from a private um, point of view. In addition to that, we'll understand how to best utilize private investment in Boston's open spaces to prioritize equity and access to public spaces, as well as support the BPDA and Parks Department um, in decision-making processes such as design review. Um, and then lastly, um, establish a clear framework for publicly accessible spaces that are viable for at least 15 years. Next slide. Um, it is expected that the selected consultant team will perform these tasks. Um, they include a uh, kickoff in regard to defining success in regards to plan, planning and management, task two, site and context analysis, task three, community engagement, task four, spatial and topological framework, and finally um, putting together a final framework and report. Next slide. The RFP received more than 150 interested parties um, downloads and was procured through a variety of different channels. Um, and in, in addition to having a virtual pre-submission conference um, um, on February 8th, we, the BPDA received seven proposals and the, that were evaluated by the BPDA and Art Lab through the process that took place um, March 18th to the 20, 27th. Next slide. Um, all seven proposals were evaluated based on comprehend, comparative evaluation criteria um, that was stated in the RFP. The final composition composite ranking um, resulted in finding Gale Studio as the most highly advantageous respondent given their highly relevant technical experience, strong team composition, and compelling approach. Their extended team includes Grayscale Collaborative, Agora Partners, Livable Street Alliance, and RKG Associates. Um, the awarded contract will be for the amount not to exceed $500,000 $599,660 for up to 18 months. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Um, okay, I just want to say that I think this is this is great. I love a framework, <laughs> um, and and this project. I just wanted to, again, just just uh, just kudos and, and cheer you guys on um, that. You know, this is going to be a really great benefit to the city. I like your approach that you're taking of. Uh, you know, uh, tackling specific topics, right, that are applicable to the entire city, and then like, it just works with my brain of trying of trying to kind of like, what's the bigger picture there, and how do we plan this um, accordingly, right? What is that that mix and the needs, different needs of the, you know, of each, you know, each area, but just the city as the city as a whole. So, um, and I'm, uh, yeah, so excited uh, about this. So. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, we'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, great job. Good luck. Okay, item number 14. 
Request authorization to execute a contract amendment to the Harvard Enterprise Research Campus District and Greenway Plan for consultant services with Claire Weiss Architects LLP, doing business as WXY Architecture and Urban Design, to increase the contract by $13,600 for a new total contract amount of $363,600. Brief. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, I'm here to request approval to amend the contract for the Harvard e Research Campus District and Greenway Plan, also known as ERC, with WXY, um, in an amount of $13,600 to accurately reflect the contract amount according to the Exhibit B that's in the current contract. Um, this plan was last presented to you all in July of 2023 where it was authorized to execute a contract with WXY Architecture and Urban Design for um, an amount of $350,000. Um, and just a little bit of background history, this plan emerged out of, a, out of the ERC Phase A mitigation and community benefit package that was approved by the board in July of 2022. Um, and that was also in response to community requests for a more comprehensive regulatory master plan uh, for the 22-acre Harvard um, area outside of the ERC phase A and B. Um, this amendment will correct the total project amount as indicated in exhibit B, exhibit B of the current contract. Typically, both labor and reimbursements are included in the total project fee. However, in this case, the exhibit um, Exhibit B outlines $350,000 for labor only and $13,600 as a separate item for reimbursements and expenses. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, makes sense. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Breeze. Thank you. All right, item number 15. Uh, request authorization to execute a contract with Kittleson and Associates for Squares and Streets Transportation Planning Support for a term not to exceed 18 months with the option to extend the contract for one year and a total contract amount not to exceed $599,987. Lydia. Thank you so much uh, and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Jemison. My name is Lydia Housley. I'm a senior transportation planner with the DPDA's Transportation Infrastructure Department. Um, following an RFP process that was authorized by this board in January of 2024, I am here again to today seeking authorization for the director to enter into a contract with the selected consultant, Kittleson and Associates, for transportation planning services that are associated with Boston Squares and Streets Initiative. Through this contract, the consulting team will work in close collaboration with our internal teams and the streets cabinet to provide transportation planning and design services in six different squares and streets geographies. Um, and this work will include collecting and analyzing transportation data, um, uh, developing recommendations that are responsive to uh, transportation needs in each planning area and ultimately providing implementation support as well. Through the RFP process, we received proposals from four great teams, all of which met the minimum threshold requirements and um, met basic quality requirements in the RFP, uh, which included um, qualifications of the project manager, team experience with similar projects, their local knowledge and understanding of the, the context in which we would be working, um, their general understanding of the project and the nexus between transportation planning and land use and economic development. Um, and the effectiveness and efficiency of their proposed approach, given that we are talking about planning to take place in six different geographies. Um, we developed an evaluation committee with five individuals um, and convened that group to review the proposals and ultimately interviews with all four teams were conducted. And after this evaluation, Kittleson and Associates was identified as the most advantageous uh, team for this contract. Uh, the award contract shall be for 18 months with the BPD holding an option to extend for one additional year as needed to uh, exercise that our sole discretion and the contract value will be for an amount not to exceed $599,987 funded through the operating budget. With that, I uh, thank you for your time and consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. 
Mr. Shepard? There was an I, right? Yeah. No, it's Okay. <laughs> uh, and the chair votes. I motion passes. Uh, thanks, Lydia, and, and good luck with that, that project transportation. Super important. <laughs> so, um, okay, item number 16, request authorization to adopt a minor modification to the Washington Park Urban Renewal Area, or no, Urban Renewal Plan. Project number Mass R-24, located at 7, uh, 7 through 9 Westminster Terrace to create parcels L49 and L50 and clarify its land uses. Zachary. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas, Director Jemison. Uh, my name is Zachary Gagne. I'm the Urban Renewal and Development Manager uh, for data here at the BPDA. Um, as stated, before you is a request for a minor modification to the Washington Park Urban Renewal Plan regarding parcels L49 and L50. Uh, these two vacant parcels are located at 7 and 9 Westminster Terrace, and um, they total approximately 5,000 square feet. Um, tentative designation and disposition of these parcels was already approved on October 12th, 2023. Uh, but in order to finalize the disposition process and remain consistent with your renewal plan, today's request is to formally amend the plan to create uh, parcels L49 and L50 for residential uses. Here for any questions. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing on admission is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Mission passes. Thanks, Zachary. Thank you. Uh, item number 17, request authorization to issue a certification of, no, a certificate of completion for the successful completion of the renovation of parcel R 31A 3 in the Charlestown Urban Renewal Area. Project number mass uh, R-55, located at 40 Warren Street in Charlestown. Pursuant to a second amendment to the land disposition agreement by and between the Boston Redevelopment Authority to a business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency and RECP v. 40 Warren Owner LLC, dated June 27, 2019. Uh, oh, this is a certificate of completion. So. Um, no presentation, correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, so a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 18, request authorization to petition the Zoning Commission to adopt tax amendments to Article 80 and, no, Article 60 and, well, yeah. Article 60 and Article 80, and adopt associated map amendments to zoning maps A, A, B, and C to establish new squares and streets zoning districts in Mattapan that are regulated by the new Article 26 and associated base code articles, clarify the applicability applicability of a Article 80 small and large project review in squares and streets districts and remove the community commercial sub districts, uh, gateway development area overlay districts and residential development incentives to reflect where squares and streets zoning will replace the existing Article 60 sub, sub districts. Jack. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Paul Hemis. Uh, my name is Jack Halverson, a planner on the zoning reform team, and it is my great pleasure to present to you zoning text amendments and maps to establish squares and street zoning districts in Mattapan. Next slide, please. This is the first place in the city we propose mapping new squares and streets districts. Um, this zoning is grounded in Plan Mattapan and implements recommendations resulting from that extensive community process. Next slide. As a reminder, uh, Plan Mattapan was a five-year planning process that culminated in um, this board adopting the plan in May of 2023. 
It included a series of actionable recommendations across uh, several different topics like housing, mobility, and jobs, just to name a few. And zoning is just one of the tools to implement these recommendations, aside from capital projects and city programs through other departments. Next slide. Um, late last year, we brought before you a residential zoning amendment for Mattapan to make accessory dwelling units as of right throughout the neighborhood's residential fabric. Uh, today's zoning amendment is not focused on these residential subdistricts, but we are proposing a small change to Mattapan's Article 60 that is essential to enabling accessory dwelling units. This change means that these accessory dwelling units are subject to their own yard requirements, which were approved by this board, um, rather than having to comply with the yard requirements of the main building on the lot. Next slide. Aside from zoning for residential parts of the neighborhood, Plan Mattapan had recommendations for areas called nodes and corridors, or the more active commercial and mixed use parts of the neighborhood like Mattapan Square and Blue Hill Ave. These recommendations focus on improving access to goods and services, helping encourage the development of local businesses and cultural destinations, and promoting more housing to help meet the needs of our city. Through the planning process, residents expressed a need for more recreational and social activities, sit-down restaurants, and smaller commercial spaces. Next slide. A key foundation of the plan envisions a future where Mattapan Square and other neighborhood nodes are home to vibrant, thriving local businesses and cultural spaces that reflect the needs of residents and uphold neighborhood identity. Zoning as a tool can allow these small businesses and cultural uses to be built, um, it can require that buildings have active ground floor uses, and updating zoning can alleviate the over-reliance on zoning variances that we often see today. Next slide. As an example, um, at a small scale for zoning violations, uh, this juice cafe replaced a convenience store in Mattapan Square. Uh, it was cited for violating zoning uh, because they weren't providing takeout, or because they were providing takeout and were not providing off-street parking. Um, however, this section of Blue Hill Ave has many small restaurants just like this um, that have takeout and don't provide parking, um, instead relying on busy foot traffic and their proximity to transit. So new zoning here can make takeout allowed and not require that additional parking. Next slide. For a larger example, the loop at Mattapan Station is an Article 80 large project that was completed in 2022. Um, it has 135 residential units and ground floor retail spaces. The project is 75 feet tall, which exceeds the allowed uh, 65 foot maximum in underlying zoning. And the current zoning makes multifamily residential actually a conditional use here. So new zoning can allow multifamily residential, uh, especially near transit and in the heart of this commercial center, um, and allow building heights that actually enable affordable housing. And as a reminder, even if a project of this size complies with underlying zoning, it still has to go through the Article 80 process uh, to determine community benefits and improve the project's design. Next slide. So we held a public engagement process for the new zoning before you today uh, with Mattapan residents and stakeholders in parallel with the broader squares and streets zoning engagement. Next slide. We started with a kickoff meeting last November to introduce uh, what squares and streets zoning is and connect the goals of squares and streets with the recommendations from Plan Mattapan. And on average, um, we had about 20 attendees at each of our public meetings. Um, in December, we released the draft zoning text and maps for Mattapan along with uh, the broader citywide squares and streets zoning. And then in January, we began a lot more targeted engagement efforts. Um, we attended the Greater Mattapan Neighborhood Council meeting to answer their questions. Um, that group also collected feedback from over 100 uh, Mattapan community members and compiled them into a comment letter that they submitted uh, via our survey. Next slide. We also held a virtual meeting that served as a plan implementation update with eight other city departments. Um, the goal of this was to help attendees understand that zoning is just one tool in implementing recommendations. We also held an in-person open house for business and property owners in our proposed rezoning areas where uh, they could learn about the zoning, but also so they could connect with um, other city departments like the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, the Mayor's Office of Housing, uh, the Inspectional Services Department, and licensing. And the primary goal here was helping uh, connect the dots with zoning and other city programs and policies that help small business owners and property owners. We had 20 attendees at that meeting, um, each of whom were either a business owner, property owner, or both. 
And finally, there was a closeout public meeting in February where we recapped our engagement um, and responded to comments received throughout the process. Next slide. Like our other initiatives, um, we held informal office hours for Q&A. We had one-on-one -on -one calls with community members and we had an online survey. Um, we also mailed out postcards to every property and property owner within the proposed zoning areas. Uh, next slide. So now I'll go through the proposed squares and streets zoning uh, for Mattapan. Next. Um, as a reminder from the last board meeting, um, there are six squares and streets districts. Uh, they vary in intensity and activity with different dimensional and land use regulations. Um, I'll summarize them briefly in subsequent slides, but here I want to note that the S5 district, um, which allows heights up to 145 feet, is not proposed for Mattapan, as it does not align with any of the recommendations um, from the community through the planning process. Next slide. This map shows the zoning recommendations from Plan Mattapan. Um, these five highlighted areas are where we're proposing squares and streets zoning, uh, which align with the mixed use and commercial zoning recommendations from the plan. Um, when we were working on mapping squares and streets districts here, we used the plan recommendations as a starting point, uh, but went even more in depth than the planning process uh, to look at other elements like parcel sizes and land uses today. Next slide. When we look at the official zoning map for Mattapan, the Greater Mattapan Neighborhood Zoning District is regulated by Article 60. Um, this zoning district goes all the way up to Franklin Park and includes a lot of what people colloquially call Dorchester. Um, so Plan Mattapan only looked south of Morton Street and that's where we're proposing this new zoning. Currently, these commercial parts of the neighborhood um, are part of neighborhood business subdistricts. And squares and street zoning regulations will exist in the new Article 26 in the zoning code. Um, so we're proposing that many of the existing neighborhood business districts will actually be replaced by squares and street zoning. The blue areas highlighted here would be regulated by that Article 26, and the yellow is what will continue to be regulated by Article 60. Uh, part of today's amendment is removing the gateway development area overlay districts and the residential development incentives that are in Article 60. Um, and that's because squares and streets districts actually exceed the additional density and height that's allowed by each of those provisions. Next slide. Um, I mentioned this before, but we did not do a direct one-to-one uh, -one translation of the existing business districts to new squares and streets districts. Um, nor did we take that zoning map from the plan and just change everything to squares and streets. Um, instead, we mapped them in a much more targeted way that reflects existing conditions, uh, the lot sizes, what land uses are there today, and what types of land uses the community uh, wanted to see in the future. Next slide. So the S0 district is primarily residential and provides a transition from lower activity residential areas to mixed use and higher activity squares and streets. Next. S0 is primarily mapped in the periphery of the square, where there are really well-established and built-out residential properties. Um, S0 allows for infill development that matches the scale um, that exists there today, while preventing some more encroachment from larger commercial land uses. Uh, for example, there's a portion of Blue Hill Ave that has a series of really consistent, well-built-out um, tri triple-deckers that fit into this S0 context. Um, there's also a portion around Fremont and Babson Street uh, where the former St. Angela School um, is actually a really great example um, of a maximum build out with 14 units of housing. That's a, a recent adaptive reuse project. Next slide. The next district, um, S1, is primarily residential but introduces more mixed use activity and opportunities uh, like small neighborhood serving retail and restaurants on the ground floor. Next slide. S1 is mapped in places that have medium scale multifamily buildings like um, the Mattapan Health and Rehab Center or the Coat Village townhomes. Um, the area to the west on the map here um, is currently zoned as residential, but was identified in Plan Mattapan as a key node for more neighborhood serving goods and services. Um, these are typically places with an existing mix of residential buildings with some ground floor retail or residential buildings that are sort of interspersed with smaller commercial spaces. Um, another example is along Blue Hill Ave, uh, just south of Morton Street. Next slide. 
Um, the S2 district has small to medium scale mixed use buildings that can fill the entire width of a lot uh, to help create a continuous kind of main street feel. It also introduces requirements for outdoor amenity space like balconies, plazas, and roof decks. Next. S2 is most um, significantly mapped along Blue Hill Ave between Mattapan Square and Morton Street, uh, where buildings are taller or denser already and have active commercial uses today. The lots here typically have that zero lot line condition with a main street feel. Um, and we're also proposing this around the Morton Street commuter rail station. Um, this is a place where the plan called for more street activity and housing density um, right next to that transit stop. Next slide. The S3 district has medium scale buildings that are required to have active uses on the ground floor um, and allow buildings up to seven stories tall. Most commercial uses are allowed or conditionally allowed here. Next. Um, active ground floors were a really key recommendation from Plan Mattapan and are directly integrated into squares and streets. Um, Mattapan residents really wanted to prioritize public facing commercial activity on the street level to really activate and enliven the square and Blue Hill Ave. Next. The S3 district is proposed for the area around Blue Hill Ave and Morton Street. Um, the lots over here tend to be bigger and have that Main Street feel. Um, there are already a lot of commercial uses on the ground floor, but they're mostly one-story buildings. Um, Plan Matt of Hand suggested that this area can really support more housing and more height uh, because of its location at a major intersection of activity. There's um, another S3 area uh, around River Street and Cummins Highway. Um, again, that's because the lots are typically large here and have uh, active uses. Um, but S3 is also really appropriate here because even though it's next to a residential subdistrict, um, the building width and floor plates have maximums that really help transition uh, into the more intense kind of part of Mattapan Square. Next slide. And finally, um, the S4 district allows medium to large scale mixed use buildings uh, with the widest range of uses. Uses aren't restricted as much to the ground floor, and even larger land uses are uh, conditional or allowed. Next. S4 is really mapped in the heart of Mattapan Square. Um, the lot sizes here tend to be uh, the largest, with a lot of larger land uses already existing, like the Mattapan um, Community Health Center. And a lot of the businesses are single story and really have the potential to support additional um, community space, cultural space, or housing on those upper floors. Next. And I just wanted to end with a reminder again um, about the Article 80 review process um, and that zoning really just provides the maximum envelope for what can be built. Um, through our engagement process, we got a lot of comments about things like uh, better landscaping design, um, improving the public realm, a lot of uh, like holistic parking management, and, and a lot more. Um, these are all elements that are really critical to the Article 80 process, and projects within squares and streets will still be subject to it. Um, as such, uh, part of the zoning amendment today is to add clarifying language within Article 80 to affirm that squares and streets districts are subject to the small and large project review. Uh, next slide. So thank you for your time this evening. Um, Kathleen and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Great. Um, questions or comments from the board? Um, this is an interesting. This is an interesting one. I was just. Uh, I appreciate the approach that you took. Right, like it. We spent five years <laughs> with Plan Mattapan, right? The, the big like neighborhood. And so, um, uh, I guess I. Um, I'm just very pleased that we didn't kind of take a, an easy, <laughs> you know, um, an, an easy route of just being like, okay, here's the plan. Let me just like, just, this is a mapping exercise, right? Like, um, and uh, so the, I just want to commend your team for recognizing that um, the areas where uh, community engagement was needed, right? In this new squares and streets way of working, um, and, you know, it was really evident that your kind of 
considering all the various stakeholder groups and their specific needs and kind of creating those um, those engagement opportunities for them. So um, I, uh, uh, I just think this is, a real, this is a really great job and a really great illustration of how, what Squares and Streets looks like, like what that finished product looks like um, as we go through the, um, uh, the other neighborhood areas that we're that we're going to focus on. So um, this all, you know, again, made sense, right? It was in language. I mean, I like zoning um, and learn the zoning language way of speaking or or reading. But again, this is um, this was easy to understand, right? Logical, the pictures, all of that of saying like, oh, OK, there there is a plan. I see it when I see the building and being like, yeah, we could totally put more stuff on top of that, right? Like that is underutilized. And, and so anyway, um, it was really clear to me as a community member within this community, even though I know I'm south of Morton Street, so I would, <laughs> but um, uh, to see that, right? This is a community that I see. This is These are the buildings that I see every day. And, uh, and now I have a, uh, yeah, a clear, tangible plan, or you know, to refer to of like, okay, this is where, this is where we're going, right? This is where we want to be. So anyway, I get really excited about um, zoning and all this stuff. So uh, let me just just stop because I could go on forever. <laughs> okay, so um, with that, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepherd. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Great job. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Secretary Polhemus, um, is it time to to switch over? Yes, we should take a five minute break. Okay. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. Sorry, we're still time clock in my head. So we're going to take a five minute break. Uh, we'll be back at 11 or five. 5.38 or so, <laughs> um, and we'll start the public hearing portion of the meeting. Thank you.
Perfect. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with the first public hearing. That's agenda item number 29. Uh, simultaneous Spanish interpretations are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you please be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until the instructions on how to access interpretation services have been translated into Spanish. Once interpretation is enabled, the globe icon will appear at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's also an important reminder to all who are presenting and commenting today, we ask that you speak slowly for the interpreters. If you're speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak more slowly so that the translator can catch up uh, with, with your information, so thank you. Uh, to enable interpretation for Spanish, please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. Uh, and you must also mute original audio. <clears throat> So uh, now, uh, Juan, will you uh, please interpret the instructions I gave into Spanish? Hello, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish and Portuguese interpreter. We'll be interpreting in Spanish tonight. Muy buenas noches para todos y bienvenidos a la reunión pública del día de hoy, item 29. El servicio de interpretación está siendo ofrecido en esta reunión utilizando la función de interpretación del lenguaje de Zoom. Les pedimos, por favor, que sean pacientes en caso de que se presente alguna dificultad de tipo técnica. La función de interpretación no será habilitada hasta que no se den las instrucciones de cómo accesar los servicios de interpretación en español y sean explicados. Una vez el servicio de interpretación sea habilitado, aparecerá un globo en la parte inferior derecha de sus pantallas. Es importante recordarles a todos aquellos que estén presentes en esta reunión, que no vayan a hablar muy rápido, de lo contrario, se les va a tener que pedir que hablen más despacio e interrumpirles para que el intérprete pueda ir al paso de la interpretación. Muchas gracias por participar de la reunión de hoy. Para habilitar el globo de la pantalla de la interpretación, localicen el globo en la parte inferior y hagan un clic sobre el español. Bienvenidos a la reunión. Muchas gracias. Back to you, Madam Chair. Okay, gracias, Juan. Um, and Ani, will you now please activate the interpretation channel? I'm going to give folks a brief uh, some time to, to join the channel. Again, you can see the globe icon on the bottom of the screen, and uh, you could just select your language. Yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> All right, so if you're having difficulty activating the interpretation, please call the phone number on the screen. And if you have difficulties with the translation later um, in the meeting, you can also call that same number. We do have interpreters available to assist you over the phone. Um, Secretary Bohemus, I'm just checking in to see if the channels are up and running. Yes, they sound good. Perfect. Um, okay, so this project presentation <clears throat> has also been translated into Spanish and is available on the BPDA website at uh, bostonplans.org slash about dash us slash bpda dash board slash board dash meetings. <clears throat> Please take note of the website address on the screen to view the translated project presentation. <clears throat> this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with articles 80A-2 80B-5, 80B, and 80C-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed core on the dot phase 1B, 505 Dorchester Avenue, 65 and 75 Ellery Street land in South Boston. <clears throat> This hearing was duly advertised on March 28th, 2024 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time, so if you're planning to testify, Please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Uh, you can click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. Uh, when your hand is raised, it will be blue. <clears throat> if you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. 
When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. And at that time, we ask that you please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And Nick, uh, the floor is yours. Please begin the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, Chief Jemison and Secretary Bohemus, I'm here before you to present 505 Dorchester Avenue, 65 and 75 Ellery Street, and the development plan for phase 1B of the master plan for plan development area number 104, 475 to 511 Dorchester Avenue, also known as Core on the Dot, which was approved by this board in October of last year, along with phase 1A, 495 Dorchester Avenue, which was approved in January of this year. Located in South Boston on Dorchester Avenue, roughly between Broadway and Andrews Stations, 505 Dorchester Avenue, 65 and 75 Ellery Street represents the remaining buildings in phase one of the master plan. The proposed project calls for the construction of three new all-electric LEED Gold certified commercial office lab buildings with active ground floor retail uses. Phase 1B will contain approximately 1.386 million square feet of gross floor area, including approximately 1.32 million square feet of office to lab space, approximately 60,000 square feet of retail space, and below grade parking. Importantly, Phase 1B will also include two new open spaces, one on either side of Ellery Street, for over an acre of new space in Phase 1 of the overall project. In addition to numerous public realm upgrades to the immediate site, including a new street network, new blue bike stations, and approximately 150 new trees, the project will contribute $6,932,500 towards the city or through city-approved in-kind construction for its transportation and res resilience improvements to areas near the project site. Before I turn to my colleague, Michelle Yee, who will take you through the planning context, I want to acknowledge the letter of support we received this afternoon from Councilor Flynn. John Sazel from the development team will then begin the presentation. Thank you. I'm sorry, Nick, is, is Michelle going? Are we? Handing it over to the development team. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And the one after? Uh, it doesn't seem like she is Oh, I, uh, I am there. Okay, great. Thank Sorry. You, go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Roja, Secretary Williamus, members of the board, Director and Director Jamison. My name is Michelle Lee, and I am the BPDA Zoning Compliance Planner assigned to this proposal. The proposed projects at 65 Ellery, 75 Ellery, and 505 Dorchester Ave are within the boundaries of plan development area number 144, Core on the Dot, which, as Nick had mentioned, was approved by the BPDA Board in October 2023 and by the Zoning Commission in December 2023. These projects also fall under Article 25A, the Coastal Flood Resilience Overlay District, or CFROD. And then these projects also fall within the boundaries of Plan South Boston, Dorchester Avenue, which was adopted by the BPTA Board in December 2016. Next slide, please. From Plan Dot Avenue, similar to CORE's last phase, Phase 1A, this area was envisioned to have the greatest height and densities in the plan area. This area was also envisioned to include an overall mix of ground floor retail, commercial offices, research and development, civic and cultural uses, and residential. Uh, next slide, please. This proposal is consistent with the use and dimensional regulations of Plan Ave and with PDA Master Plan Number 144, as it is creating mixed-use commercial offices and research and development buildings with active ground floor uses. This proposal is also providing approximately 1.5 acres of consolidated, publicly accessible open space. In regards to transportation, this proposal provides building setbacks to meet both the complete street standards and, and planned dot ash street grid. The proposal provides space and payments for 319 dock blue bikes, bike share stations, 
and the maximum number of off-street parking spaces allowed by this proposal is compliant with the restricted parking overlay district and Boston Transportation Department's maximum parking ratios. These projects will also provide a $5 per, per square foot of off-site transportation mitigation funds that is consistent with PDA master plan number 144. Pending board approval and subsequent zoning board of appeal approval of the required zoning relief, the proposed projects would undergo further design review at the PPDA. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. Thank you, Michelle. This is John Sissel, president of Core Investments, and my job is just to say thank you. We just are continually grateful for the many who have helped work with us to get us to today's vote. We just acknowledge the hard work of the city staff at the BPDA and the leadership of Arthur Jamison and Nick Carter, our project manager, and many, many others who have worked with us tirelessly over, over now what has been years in a process that we believe has really uh, come to today and, and is ready to go forward. So we're excited to have this presentation. We're also really thankful for uh, a, a number of other groups like the BCDC who intensely worked with us over the last last year relative to the many subcommittees and, and then the full commission vote along with so many others within the city. The local community with the leadership of Andrew Score Civic and our IAG group along with the many neighbors who have engaged in the process and then of course our many electorate in the South Boston community that have shown support and also great guidance in our process. And, Last but not least, our professionals who are presenting tonight only represent a fraction of the hundreds who have worked on this project to date, and so we're just so appreciative of you all to uh, allow us to get to this point and have the board consider uh, this project and, and the vote this evening. So thank you, and with that, I'll hand it over to Mark Rosenshine to start the presentation. Thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Secretary Bohemus, Director uh, Jamison, members of the board. Uh, thank you very much. What you're looking at here, if you recall back in October, as was mentioned, 20 acres of master plan PDA that we went and, and brought to you and, and worked with the community on. Uh, that 20 acres was divided into, next slide please, four phases. Phase one involved four buildings, a residential building at 495 Dorchester Avenue and three commercial buildings at 65 and 75 Ellery, and then 505 Dorchester Avenue and two open spaces. If you remember, we asked uh, your indulgence to allow us to move 495, the residential project, forward at a slightly faster pace back in January. You approved that as phase 1A in order for us to align with the MOH process and timeline for affordable housing. And we promised we would be back very soon. If not, uh, I think I even said May, so we're a little ahead of schedule. Once we had a chance to work with urban design staff, BCDC, and others to really refine and, and, and give further detail on the open spaces and the three commercial buildings that you see here. Uh, next slide, please. And, and just to illustrate that, in, you know, graphically, phase 1A was exclusively and only the footprint of the building, uh, of the residential building. And so what we're here for you to look at and, and determine tonight is phase 1B. I'm going to turn it over to uh, BK Boley and, and Rob Adams, our landscape architect and, and design architect, to walk you through that, and then come back and we can talk about mitigation measures and other things at the end. Uh, BK, it's all yours. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Jameson. I'm delighted to be here. I'm BK Boley, Senior Design Principal, Stantec Architecture. Um, of note, I'm also a South Boston resident, and I live just at the bottom of this slide within eye shot of this project. And as my daughter told me, Dad, don't screw this one up. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do was just walk you through, if you can go to the next slide, our uh, Plan Dot Avenue compliance, and as Michelle said, we are consistent with the spirit and the guidelines of Plan Dot Avenue. Uh, to note here, we have exceeded the open space in our first phase. We're at 33% open space because we really wanted to bring two parks to this area so close to Andrew Station. Um, then we've created those right-of-way setbacks that she mentioned so that we can have complete streets on all the streets that we're, we're talking about here. Um, and then we have stepped back the building above the podiums with the taller buildings on the west side of the site uh, to create what you'll see through imagery um, of the building design and the landscape. Next slide. This shows you an image looking from Dorchester Avenue into the first park, East Park, and you're looking at 495, which was previously approved on the right-hand side. The building in the center is 65 Ellery Street, and the building on the left is 75 Ellery Street. 
Next slide. This shows the ground level of the phase 1B, um, and it's in keeping with what we were trying to attain in phase 1A, which is essentially taking that light blue color, which is the retail color, having it come along Dorchester Avenue, wrap into the park, and then wrap around onto Ellery Street. The idea is to create an active ground floor all the way around these buildings um, to move service and loading to the service road side of the buildings, uh, but to really have eyes on the street in an area of town that really needs this level of activation, this excitement. Next slide. One of the interesting things about our site, it is right on the edge of what was the historic South Bay shoreline. We have two buildings that are actually sitting in the historic water line. Um, that is this first building, 65 Ellery Street. And you can see the image on the bottom right, which is of a schooner. We wanted to take some of the history of this section of South Boston and bring it into the design of the building. So we have two buildings that are more sculptural and organic, and then one building that is grounded on the shoreline. And I'll talk about that in a second. So 65 Ellery Street is based upon the concept of the schooner. Um, again, it has these beautiful sail-like elements that you'll be able to see from a great distance in the same way that you could see the tall ships 150 years ago when you're entering into Boston. Next. This is 75 Ellery Street. The view on the left is looking over the bridge at Southampton Street. Uh, Southampton Street. Um, this was based upon the concept of the water lily. We wanted something that was organic, sustainable, but also optimistic and expressive. Um, as Nick mentioned, all three of these buildings are emission-free, all-electric, passive house, lead gold buildings. So they are at the cutting edge of technology, um, and they're trying to give back to the environment rather than take. Next. And finally, before I hand it over to Rob Adams, our landscape architect, we wanted to show you the building that sits on Dorchester Avenue. This is 505 Dot Avenue. And its inspiration is based upon the mill buildings that used to be along the shoreline with brick masonry. And then that kind of angular gesture is inspired by the cranes uh, and the iron workers that used to be on the edge of this site. Well, the iron workers are still only a block away, but what I meant was the cranes that were on the edge of this site and along the waterfront. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob Adams, who's going to walk you through the landscape and some of the pedestrian views and how we've worked with the BPDA, the BCDC, and the community to create a real walkable, lovely, active space. Rob? Great. Thanks, VK. Um, so Rob Adams with Halverson Design Landscape Architects. Uh, evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Director Jamison. I'm going to step back uh, a little bit, both in scale as well as involvement. This first slide, uh, I think, speaks to both core, the project team's investment into the community, um, as we've lovingly called the Emerald Bracelet concept. This idea, Olmsted's vision of connecting, uh, making a full loop of the Emerald Necklace, connecting Franklin Park back to Pleasure Bay, um, and the proponent's desire to help facilitate this. You can see in the bottom image dot av as it runs north south is really a critical we think a critical link and you'll see later on within the presentation the i'll say the investment within the public realm both the streetscape of dorchester avenue but all the open space also the open space really trying to foster this idea of creating links back into the city uh, next slide please and on a larger kind of contextual community outreach program the design team has for uh, a couple years now been reaching out to the community to start to talk about the public spaces, the two open spaces associated with this project, as well as the public realm, the streetscape. Uh, most recently, there's a large community forum that CORE sponsored uh, on the uh, uh, kind of on the um, on the lot facility right next door to this project site. We had a great turnout from the community. You can see in the bottom left there was coloring books in which we asked kids to talk about what their hopes and dreams were for the open spaces. And then on the right, there was also, we'll call them voting exercises, in which we gave people the opportunity to vote and place priorities on what kind of uh, program and elements and art and uses and stores they would like to see within the uh, community. And so it's been a real, I'll say, inclusive project from day one, and it's been a process that has really informed, I think, the open space, as you'll see uh, in the upcoming slides. 
Next, please. So stepping back again to the plan, .av is on the bottom of this page. West is actually up. So we get these great sunsets across uh, the entire project. Um, one thing we want to talk about just real quickly is the resiliency point of view. All of these buildings are set at their finished floor and critical infrastructure above the floodplain. That requires some front porches, if you will, for the 505 and 495 on the front Dorchester Avenue side. And the really positive part about this solution is that it slopes up gradually from Dot Ave to Service Road, creating that um, essentially barrier in the future for sea level rise and storm surge. But getting back to the parks, um, or the open space you'll see as we've kind of lovingly called on the bottom is east open space. The one on the top is called west open space. Ellery Street running through the middle is a real uh, pedestrian promenade. And you'll notice on all of these streetscapes, uh, full complete street compliant, street trees, bike facilities, wide sidewalks, frontage zones along the buildings. So I think if nothing else, there's been a real investment in the public realm along the streetscapes. And you can see the two open spaces, the one on the front, on the bottom is East Open Space, as I mentioned. It's really kind of this big open, I call it the lungs of the space, right? It's a big void, big civic lawn, void in a positive way, surrounded by trees and program. The Western space is more intimate in scale, creates a series of garden rooms that you'll see in a little bit, um, but really trying to make, and I think BCDC in the city, BPA staff did a great job of pushing us to help create a, a difference of quality of the two spaces, ultimately all about places for the community, right? An earnestness, maybe even a little bit of grittiness to the quality and the materials of these open spaces. Next slide, please. And so drilling down into the program in East Open Space, again, talking about this idea of a big open long where events can occur, and then really kind of ringing the, uh, outlining the, the civic lawn with a variety of program uses that have been inspired through that community outreach. So small play feature, small interactive water feature, a small stage element incorporated into the 495 building, picnic area with pavilions for community to gather, a little event plaza, and also smartly thinking about stormwater management, collecting stormwater, infiltrating stormwater as part of the part of the design vocabulary of the open space. And on the next slide, I think we'll see a couple of views. So this is really about standing on Dorchester Avenue and you see this great civic lawn kind of unfolding in front of you using kind of robust and rich materials of the, of the maritime kind of edge as BK talked about. And I think on the next slide, it's another um, image. And this is a little bit more about these intimate spaces that start to ring the outside of the civic lawn, acknowledging the diversity and the character of the different spaces. Next slide, please. And then on West Lawn, as I talked about, a variety of different scaled rooms. The seating lawn at the middle with its topography, and then a couple we call them arbor rooms, but essentially a couple rooms created by a tree canopy and intimate spaces below. On the next slide, please. And so you can see the quality of that space is different, right? Much smaller scale, more lush plantings, movable furnishings that start to have a relationship to the ground floor uses of the building. Next slide, please. And then that kind of larger, uh, it's larger, that medium scale lawn with its topography, what it does really nicely and the arbor in the background creates this nice, I'll say level porosity for the sunset and for the long views, but also blocks out and gives a terminus to these two parks so that the railroad tracks don't feel like they're kind of bleeding or the parks bleed into the railroad tracks, but holds that edge really nicely. Next slide, please. And I think here's a great image where the rubber kind of hits the road around this idea of the public infrastructure. So dot ab as we know it today. Next slide, please. And dot ab after the proposed project. And you can see just the game-changing quality of on-street parking, bike facilities, street trees, wide pedestrian realms, this kind of front porch idea uh, uh, around the resiliency and sea level rise change of the finished floor, making that a, an amenity rather than a barrier to, uh, to the uh, pedestrian between the public realm and the ground floor of the building. Next slide, please. I think it's Mark's turn. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> and as previously noted um, by Michelle, there is a, a transportation mitigation of up to $5 a square foot for off-site transportation mitigation, which is a significant community benefit and, and impact uh, mitigation measure. The other one that I want to note out of this entire list that hasn't been brought up specifically is really the hazardous material remediation on this site. This is one of the dirtiest sites remaining in the city of Boston. You'll remember we've said it before that prior to capping it with uh, 
Corps' efforts, uh, you were not allowed to stand on this site for more than 10 minutes or you'd be risking your health. And so the development of this into a open space, green space, buildings, hundreds of trees where there are none now is really about trying to uh, remediate a very dangerous uh, site on the Dorchester Avenue corridor and, and improve that environmental condition at a fundamental level. And we think, and I think the community agrees, this is one of the most important pieces of mitigation of this effort and is really the driver for this project to move forward as phase one. Right? We chose this to be phase one because we wanted to remediate this portion of the 20 acres immediately. I think that is our presentation, and, and we'll open it up for questions and comment. Okay, thank you. Um, as a public hearing, we're going to first take questions before, um, and then we'll we'll proceed with uh, board follow up. So, Secretary Polhemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is Minor Perez representing the Carpenters Union. I first like to take uh, the proponent for a great community outreach and great job on uh, the presentation. And I also want to thank the Office of Mayor Wu for allowing the community to be part of the process. Uh, we are enthusiastically in full support of this project, and I will. We wish for the board to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minor. Tom Pecoraro, you can unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Tom Pecoraro. I'm a business agent with Ironworkers Local 7 and a city resident. And um, this, uh, this project looks great. And I want to thank everybody for the presentation. It was really well put together. And um, this project being right in our backyard, of our union hall um, and on behalf of the rest of our membership i rise heavily in favor of this project and would love to see it move forward and uh, thank you very much for your presentation thank you tom patty mccormick you can unmute yourself thank you all i'm patty mccormick long time Andrew square resident vice president of the Andrew square civic association and an iag member Andrew Square has waited patiently for the revitalization of Dot Ave as it will be part of the change so desperately needed to become a healthy and vibrant neighborhood. On the dot will be the cornerstone for that transformation. It was hard to imagine the junkyard could become a destination, and now we, we're on the cusp of, of it becoming a reality. And that will include affordable housing for our elderly, jobs for South Boston and Boston residents, open space for neighbors to gather, updated infrastructure and trees on that barren stretch of Dot Ave that we all saw in that photo and so much more to our neighborhood. We're incredibly grateful to the core team for your investment in our community and for never giving up. And we're thankful to the BPDA and BCDC for their efforts and to all those who attended a meeting or open house in the last several years to get us to this point. I'm beyond thrilled to be able to speak on behalf of this project. And in doing so, I hope to honor the many residents no longer with us that were proud to be from Andrew Square and knew of its unlimited potential. Thanks, Patty. Billy Vietze, you can unmute yourself. Good evening. My name is uh, Billy Vietz. Uh, I'm a proud member of Iron Workers Local 7. I'm also a Boston resident. And uh, I just kind of want to echo what's already been mentioned about this project. Um, I, I've sat in and a lot of these calls and I've watched the presentations from the development team and I've really enjoyed them, especially the, the history portion of it. It's actually been pretty um, entertaining and enlightening and um, I just want to rise in favor of this project, uh, not only for the jobs and the housing and, and the benefits to the local economy that it will create, um, I also rise in favor as a board member of the Mass Bay Credit Union. Our headquarters is located right up the road in South Boston, and um, you know we've kept an eye on this development as well, and we've talked a lot about it and about the opportunities that it will bring to the South Boston community, which we serve. And uh, we look forward to welcoming many new members to our credit union should this project go through. So thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, questions or comments from the board? <clears throat> Just looks really good. Appreciate all of the open space um, and the support that you've obviously earned from the from the community. Thank you. Definitely, uh, my office being not too far from that location, I just think this will be um, something beautiful for the neighborhood, beautiful for the people who have to use the transportation in that area. Just it would be a nice, welcoming place to see. So, uh, again, to the development team. Thank you for the beautiful presentation and the work you've done with the community to have them on board with you. Yeah, awesome. Uh, you know, again, like design team, bravo. This is really, really cool. I, I just really, um, I, I'm excited about that you took and you took this opportunity and you had an understanding of the responsibility that uh, that comes with uh, with developing this, you know, this this size, right, of of uh, this significant portion of our city, um, and uh, and you never, you know, you never know <laughs> uh, what you're going to get. But but I'm just so so pleased with the outcome and and the design and having it uh, have history those callbacks those nods right back to uh it, that's it's really engaging right and and i love the imagery and the inspiration of schooners and water lilies and that i just love that these weren't just four boxes <laughs> you know on a corner um and uh really again looking forward and to uh you know to seeing this project um uh develop over time and um yeah i think the symbolism of the you know, replacing the, you know, what, replacing the, the, the poison, right, of that land, uh, the, um, you know, the type of environmental remediation and cleanup that we have to do, um, and, and using that space to create lungs, you know, lungs, that, that, it, it, I think it just, I don't know, that, that symbolism kind of just really, um, uh, really stuck with me, and I'm again super excited uh, for um, for this. And I just have one one question. So, um, uh, um, Mr. Bully, um, so what what does your daughter think about this? Does she <laughs> give you any feedback? Yeah, she she loves it. She's been keeping in touch. She wants a place to walk the dog, and uh, she's also an artist. So she is uh, kind of in tune with the conceptual approach to architecture and especially, like many people, everybody loves the lily pad. They, they love the lily pad building, so she does too. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome and good to hear it. And, and to, um, you know, I appreciate the way that you engage with the community and, and giving the, the, the children, right? Letting them draw, you know, uh, and uh, get their feedback uh, through that because this is what, um, uh, it, this is for them, right? <laughs> um, so, so incorporating their their thoughts is uh, is really important, and not something I always see. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, okay. So, if there are any, aren't any other questions or comments, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Great job. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we've got one more public hearing. Let's move on. on. And thank you to the interpretation, the interpreters and translation services uh, um, that we had for this meeting. We have it again for uh, for this next item. So simultaneous uh, Mandarin and Cantonese interpretations are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you please be patient in case of any technical issues. Language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access interpretation have been translated. Once interpretation has been enabled, a globe icon will appear on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, it's also an important reminder to all who are presenting and commenting today. We ask that you speak slowly for the interpreters 
<clears throat> if you were speaking too fast, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower so that our translators can catch up with the information. <clears throat> To enable interpretation service for Mandarin and Cantonese, click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select the language uh, you want to hear. Uh, you must also mute original audio. Uh, so Terry, uh, will you now please interpret the instructions I gave into Cantonese? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 大家好,我是Terry,我是你們今天的廣東話翻譯 uh, and Tina, will you now please interpret the instructions that I gave into Mandarin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh 如果你有任何问题，请你打电话给六一七九幺八四二三三。好，谢谢你，一会儿见。Thank you. Thanks so much, Tina. And finally, Ani, will you now please uh, interpret, uh, activate the interpretation channel, and we'll give folks a, a bit of time to join. Um, as you can see now, the globe is on the bottom of the screen, and you just have to click it and select the language you want to hear. <coughs> If you are having difficulty activating the interpretation, please call the phone number on the screen. If you have difficulties with the translation later in the meeting, you can also call that same number. We have interpreters available to assist you over the phone. <clears throat> the project presentation, oh, before we move on, uh, Secretary Bohemus, are the channels uh, active and running? Yes, they are. All right, this project presentation has been translated into uh, Mandarin and Cantonese. It is available on the BPDA website at bostonplans.org slash about dash us slash BPDA dash board slash board dash meetings. Please take note of the website address on the screen to view the translated project presentation. <clears throat> this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Articles 80A-2 and ADB-5 of the Zoning Code to consider the proposed notice of project change for the Stanhope Hotel project located at 39 Stanhope Street in the Back Bay. This hearing was duly advertised on March 28, 2024 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. <clears throat> Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time, so if you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active and click on the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak, and when your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, uh, please dial star nine to raise your hand and when I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. VPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain, and at that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes, minutes for a rebuttal if they so desire. And Quinn, the floor is yours to begin the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Polimus and Director Jemison. The proposal before you is for a notice of project change for a previously approved Article 80 large project known as the Stand Up Hotel. The project is located at 39 Stanhope Street near Back Bay Station. 
The proposed project change will add one floor and approximately 10,000 square feet to the previously approved 124,000 square foot, 21 story, 300 key hotel with a restaurant space at the ground floor. The additional floor will be added without a change to the overall height of the building by decreasing the floor to floor heights of the other floors to accommodate the addition. The BPA held a joint IAG and public meeting on March 5th, 2024. That meeting is well attended and has been advertised in the local newspaper and online. I also want to note that Council President Ruth C. Lujan, District Councilor Ed Flynn, and at-large Councilor Aaron Murphy have all submitted letters of support for this project change. I now turn it over to my colleague Ted Schwartzberg from the BPA Zoning Compliance Team to discuss the planning context considered in the review of the project change before the development team begins their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, good evening, Secretary Paul Hemis, Chair Rojas, and members of the board. My name is Ted Schwartzberg. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Zoning Compliance, and I'm here to present two slides on the planning and zoning context for this proposal. Next slide, please. The Stewart Street Planning Study adopted in 2015 and the accompanying Stewart Street District Zoning Article adopted in 2016 established the planning context for the proposed project and its surrounding neighborhood. Key planning goals for the Stewart Street Corridor, which the BPDA staff applied in their review of the proposed project, include contextually appropriate growth, public realm improvement, and the provision of active ground floor uses to animate the streetscape. The area south of Boylston Street is an appropriate geography for Back Bay to grow due to the existing context of the built environment, its location outside the Back Bay Architectural District, and its proximity to transportation resources, including two MBTA subway lines and Amtrak's Northeast Corridor Rail. Accordingly, district scale planning guides and zoning regulations encourage height and mid-rise building typologies, which is consistent with the dimension of the proposed project. Next slide, please. As Quinn noted earlier, the overall uh, height and mass of the building uh, is not changing from the previously approved project. Uh, simply the FAR floor area ratio is changing by adding an existing floor within the envelope of the existing building, uh, which the proponent team will describe after me. Uh, a bit more about the planning context. At the parcel scale, the planning context calls for a balance of growth and retention of historic assets through the preservation of buildings that meet National Register for Historic Places criteria for eligibility. After, extension, after extensive study of preservation strategies, the proponents' uh, original design from their previous um, approval was modified to preserve and incorporate the existing staples into the final hotel design, which the MPC preserves as well. And most significantly, as a result of staff input, the proposed project will support future public realm improvements in a manner that follows from planning guidelines and zoning regulations that require new development to support public realm or public art. Further enhancing the pedestrian experience, hotel use in this location is directly responsive to the planning goal of active ground floor uses throughout the Stewart Street corridor. Thank you, and I'll now turn it over to the proponent to continue their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ted, and thank you, Quinn. Uh, good evening, um, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Paul Hemus. I'm Don Wiest with the Boston-based law firm of Dane Torpy. Um, with me is Harry Wheeler of the design team, uh, Boston-based firm as well, Group One. We represent H.N. Corrin uh, and Masterworks Development on this project. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank Quinn also uh, for a superb job of guiding the project through the uh, Article 80 and then the ensuing NPC process. Um, Quinn and Ted did such a great job of summarizing what this project is all about. Uh, maybe I can condense my remarks at the end of a long day a little bit. Um, we're here before you, uh, as has already been summarized, for a relatively modest change. This hotel was approved back in July of last year, uh, approximately nine months ago, at 270 feet, 300 rooms, um, and with uh, a variety of other um, project parameters that are essentially unchanged. And the question is, why are we before the board? We are adding about 10,000 square feet of exterior, uh, pardon me, of interior space. Um, that's not visible from the exterior of the project anyway. The height won't change, the width, the depth of the building itself won't change at all. 
um, our design team has come up with a clever solution of very slightly compressing the floor to floor height on each floor across 21 to 22 floors, depending on how you count the, the space in the, uh, in the base building. And that allows us to get a little bit more operational space inside the building with no external visibility and also no impacts. We're keeping the hotel room count at 300 uh, as it started out. Um, the question is why, uh, why did we uh, make this change? The answer is that the project, um, although it was brought through as a buy right project, um, had uh, two significant public realm um, commitments to make that uh, extended the permitting time. The first is, as Ted mentioned, we were asked to retain the historic stables facade. Uh, the original design of the project involved um, <clears throat> taking that building down and, and constructing a new hotel from scratch. Um, there was an extended period of negotiations with landmarks and a lot of design work to retain and incorporate that uh, original late 1800s facade. The design team did come up with a really lovely uh, solution that, that integrates old and new beautifully. Um, we think it's really a triumph, but that took some time. And then, as Ted also mentioned, we were asked to explore a longtime BTV uh, proposal, which is to pedestrianize Stanhope Street. We spent some time studying with our design team what that would look like. Um, I do want to add that the pedestrianization proposal um, may have confused some uh, of voters and folks in the neighborhood um, who mistakenly believe that was part of our proposal. We are uh, contributing funding towards that. We're certainly um, have to cooperate with that. That is an independent BTD proposal. Um, or our project never proposed, BTD still would have brought that forward. That's our understanding. Um, anyway, there's been some confusion around that actually being part of our project. It is independent, but we did spend some time studying that and made our design resources available to BTD at a very fruitful proposal. However, that led to a more than four-year permitting process in total. By the time we got out of that process with our approved project back in July, began designing an actual operating uh, hotel program within the, the permitted envelope, um, the building code has actually changed and updated twice since we proposed the project. So um, we needed more uh, life safety and more electrification equipment in the building and changed the usable square footage inside and we were running out of room very quickly. We also took the project out to restaurant brokers and um, we're, we're very keen to activate Sand Oak Street and to create an amenity not only for the hotel guests but for the neighborhood as well. We want a very good uh, uh, proven hotel operator at this site. They thought that the back of house restaurant space was, was, uh, uh, was too tight. They wanted more food storage space, more food prep space, stuff like that. Um, and there are a few other things that, that once we needed more space and we were over um, the amount of square footage we had, once we realized that if we added another floor visibly, we could also create better employee break room amenities in the basement, some other things we could add in the building, slightly better uh, fitness uh, facilities for the guests. Um, a little bit of square footage here, a little bit of square footage there. All of a sudden, uh, a new additional floor became enormously helpful to the hotel program. Um, going from an FAR of 17.5 to approximately 19 means that we do need zoning relief uh, in the project that transformed this transforms this project into a development impact project um, that will lead to a new exaction payment to the city of approximately $540,000 that was not required before and also requires a public hearing. So that's how we got before you tonight, a relatively modest uh, change to this approved project, but it does lead to several technical permitting changes. Um, and so that led us to go through the NPC process. Uh, the last thing I will mention is that um, <clears throat> We just want to underscore nothing about the hotel aside from some of these operational functional aspects is changing. Um, there were some comments again in the public process. Um, although we didn't perceive a lot of concern about this NPC, we did hear some comments about traffic, uh, which were addressed thoroughly in the original Article 80 process, including an expanded second traffic setting we did at the behest of uh, the transportation planners and BTD. Um, questions about parking, um, heights were well under the allowed zoning height. Those issues were all resolved in the original Article 80 process. The NPC is just to consider additional square footage within the permitted envelope the building with no external changes. Um, with that uh, summary concluded, um, I'm going to pass the presentation over to our gifted project architect, 
Carrie Wheeler of Group One. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Um, I'll try to live up to gifted uh, in Don, Don's recommend in Don's uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jameson, and I also want to extend a thank you to uh, Quinn and Ted, who we worked uh, over the last four years with getting this project uh, to where it is today. So appreciate all the efforts, and I think my presentation will, will be very brief. Um, you know, uh, between Quinn and Ted and Don, I think they explain very eloquently why we're here and what has changed. Uh, I would just like to run you through the design aspects of the, uh, the approved project and the revisions that we're proposing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to reacquaint everybody with the project site, we are located here on Stanhope Street. The site is located in this little blue square. Uh, it is the existing location of the Red Lantern building across from the Frito, uh, Frito Garcia Park. Uh, right, uh, next slide, please. We'll have some site images which uh, show the stable buildings working clockwise from the top left. Uh, the existing Red Lantern building uh, the friendly toast is not part of our project. That uh, was part of the original stable structures, but not part of our uh, project site. Uh, to the right is the existing alley. Uh, we go around and look at the other four sides of the approach from the Stanhope Street Alley 559, uh, and then looking in the eastern direction down Stanhope Street. Next slide, please. As Don mentioned, we received approval by the board in July of last year uh, for the project and rendering that's up in front of you, uh, you and everybody today that we can see. Uh, the existing project itself, again, the height, the massing, the width, et cetera, has not changed. Uh, what we are proposing is we worked have them concede a little bit in, in building floor to floor height changes, which will add one floor internal to the, sorry, my, everyone can hear me, right? I'm getting some fluctuation in my internet. Yeah, we've got it. You cut out for a second, but we're, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and next slide. So what we're showing you here are some side-by-side -slide, side -by -side slide comparisons uh, with the proposed uh, approved building on the left and the proposed modifications on the right. Again, we can flip through these slides pretty quickly. If this shows on all four sides, the height does not change in any way, the width does not change, the room count does not change, and the design aesthetics. We work very closely with the BPDA design staff to work with this modern interpretation of the gridded facades that we see in the Back Bay District. Um, and we've taken that through uh, the design, we've maintained that. Uh, again, slight adjustments for six inches per floor um, based on the building of this height allowed us to get one more floor in for the additional space that's required. Uh, next slide. And again, looking at everything side by side, the approved aesthetics uh, have no change. Uh, next slide, please. We can just roll through these next two slides pretty quickly. The west elevation, again, looking over the adjacent Brookline Bank building. And then the next slide, which is the rear of the building. Uh, again, where our receiving is and back, uh, the space is towards Stanhope, uh, sorry, the uh, Clarendon condominiums. Uh, again, no height, no changes, uh, no massive changes whatsoever. And our next slide just shows a quick comparison of what the facade looks like uh, from the 11 foot to the 10 foot six floor to floor. Uh, one thing that we want to touch upon here is this recess in the building, which is the, the glass between the existing building and the proposed new tower it was very important. This was studied uh, thoroughly with multiple design studies and reviews with the BPDA and um, subcommittee staff of what this right height needs to be to have that correct separation. So this is maintained. Uh, there's no dimensional change to that clear story. Uh, again, there is change to the typical guest room floors from 11 foot to 10 foot six. Uh, and the next slide, please, which is the last slide for our presentation. Again, I think um, it may have been uh, Ted that showed a slide of what we had proposed previously. Uh, this is the updated rendering, which shows it's, you know no changes. We're still restoring the facade on the Stanhope building. We're maintaining that glass separation, and then we're showing the new 10 foot six floor to floor dimensions uh, for the guest rooms, which again articulates the exact same facade uh, and detail work that we uh, were approved for back in July. So happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um... Mr. Wheeler, okay, uh, this is a public hearing, um, so let's see, Senator Bohemus, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. 
Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is representing Honduras Union Carpenters and Labor Work Club, City of Boston. I first want to congratulate the proponent for great community outreach and a great presentation. I just want to thank the Office of Mayor Michelle Wu for allowing the community to be part of the process. Uh, the, our membership and our organization is in full support of this project and we like we as we great respect um, a vote of favor. Thank you. Thank you, Minor. Joan McEachern, you can unmute yourself. Joseph McEachern? Yeah, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the board, Joe McEachern. I'm with City Councilor Emma Murphy at large office. Um, we're uh, one of the voice our uh, approval of this wonderful project. Uh, the City Councilor had supported it originally. She supports the change. And we're so very much looking forward to seeing this beautiful project up and running. And uh, you have our support. Thank you. Would anybody else like to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. Madam Chair, this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Okay, great. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any questions like or comments. You did a very good job of being clear on uh, what was changing, why it was changing, um, and uh, yeah, no, that was, a, it was, it was really effective. So I don't have any questions. Um, Thank so you. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll we'll offer a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, okay, we finished the, um, the public hearing. So let's go back to, bear with me here. <clears throat> The agenda, item number 19, is that correct, Secretary Blamus? It is. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> item number 19, request authorization to issue a, certifi a certificate of completion for the successful completion of construction of the Boston University Data Sciences uh, Center located at 665 Commonwealth Avenue in the Fenway pursuant to the cooperation agreement by and between the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency and trustees of Boston University dated January 17, 2020. This is a certificate of completion, so no presentation. Uh, motion is in order. <clears throat> so moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number 20, request, authorize, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the successful completion of parcel 25 phase two project located at one Halleck Street pursuant to the cooperation agreement by and between the Boston Redevelopment Authority, J Business as the Boston Plan and Development Agency and P25 phase two LLC dated April 24th, 2020. Certificate of completion, no presentation. Uh, motion is in order. <clears throat> so moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. It's item number 21. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the successful completion of the 130 Chestnut Hill Avenue project, also known as the J.J. Carroll redevelopment, pursuant to section C.4 of the Cooperation agreement by and between the Boston Redevelopment Authority, doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, and Two Life uh, JJ Carroll LLC, uh, dated July 24th, 2021. Um, again, certificate of completion, no presentation. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 22. Request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving further review pursuant to Article 80B Large Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed construction of 90 residential rental units, including 15 IDP units, approximately 8,400 square feet of commercial space, 57 parking, car parking spaces, and 122 bicycle storage spaces, located at 115 through 121 Boston Street, and to take all related actions. Daniel. 
Can't hear you. Sometimes those headsets get tricky. Oh, I know. <laughs> Can you, you hear go. me now? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Again, uh, my apologies, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, members of the board, Director Jemison and Secretary Plahamis. My name is uh, Daniel Polanco. I'm the project manager for the proposed Article 80 large party review for you tonight at 115 121 Boston Street, located in the Dorchester neighborhood. The project's proponent, Boston 115 Development LLC, it's proposing a new five-story mixed building with the mezzanine consisting of 90 new residential compact living units, with approximately 8,400 square feet of ground level commercial space, totaling 80, 88,339 square feet of gross floor area. The new building will be uh, will serve by 57 garage motor vehicle parking spaces, including 41 residential and 16 commercial spaces, 122 residential bicycle, sp uh, bicycle spaces within the building as well. Among the community benefits, the project will include 15 IDP rental units, accounting of approximately 16.7% uh, percent of affordability contribution. The project has also committed to the project uh, to work with improving continuous pedestrian circulation to the public sidewalk at Boston Street, West Howell Street, and the Boston Street Extension. Additionally, the project will be making contributions to, the, uh, to provide funds to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department, the Polish Club, and the Boston Collegiate Charter School. The BPDA held a, a virtual public meeting uh, and an IG meeting via Zoom for the proposed project. The IG meetings were held May 17, 2023 and September 26, 2023. While the public meeting was held June 6, 2023, the IG meeting was also advertised in local newspapers to the BPDA website and distributed to the BPDA's Dorchester email list. I thank you for your time and consideration tonight. I'll now have the development team here with me to present the project in detail. Any questions in regards to the project, any other questions you may have. And I'll turn it over to Leanna Hines, who has uh, the following context ready for us. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polimus, members of the board, and Director Jemison. I'm Ilana Haynes. I'm the zoning compliance planner assigned to this project. Uh, the proposed development project is located in the Dorchester Neighborhood District within a community commercial subdistrict pursuant to Article 65 of the Zoning Code. The project site is located within the Coastal Flood Resilience Overlay District, known as CFRAD, which requires new construction to meet resilient design standards. These standards include elevating the ground floor of the building above the base flood elevation for the year 2070 and limiting the uses that can be located below the design flood elevation. The design proposal cites the ground floor at 21 feet Boston City Base in alignment with C5 requirements. There are no recent local planning initiatives for the site at 115 121 Boston Street. The proposed development is located outside of the boundaries of the study area for the planned South Boston Dorchester Avenue uh, study, which for which the southern edge is located approximately one quarter mile north of the site. The proposed project was designed in accordance with the compact living policy for which a pilot program was in effect from 2018 and extended through 2023. The design guidelines prioritize available open space, natural light, and community spaces. Next slide, please. The proposed project is located at, oh, sorry. Uh, could you please go back one slide? Thank you. Uh, the proposed project is located at the nexus of several neighborhood planning contexts across Boston Street to the east. The neighborhood is predominated by the traditional three-story buildings that comprise much of the three-family residential fabric of the Dorchester neighborhood. The area west of the site is anchored by the South Bay Center, a, a retail and residential district established in phases over the preceding decades. The most recent phase of South Bay Center, board approved in 2016, established a new network of public streets and mixed use building typologies on the eastern edge of the shopping center. While industrial and commercial uses predominate the ad adjacent area, developments including Jan Karski Way Extension Project, board approved in 2021, will connect the streets and residential fabric of recent phases of South Bay with the existing neighborhood east of Boston Street. Next slide, please. Uh, staff review of 121 or 115 to 121 Boston Street aligned with the use form and public realm of the proposed project to ensure a meaningful contribution to the ongoing evolution and integration of this former industrial area into the fabric of Dorchester. After board approval and zoning board of appeal uh, for the required zoning relief, the proposed project will continue design review at BPDA. Thank you and we'll now turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. 
Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, Secretary Paulinus. My name is Will Chalfont from Pels Design. We are the architects on the project. Uh, as been discussed, this is uh, proposed for 90 units along with 8,400 square feet of ground retail space, excuse me, uh, as well as 122 bike storage spaces, and we are aiming for lead gold certification. Uh, next slide, please. Resumed in a little bit, but uh, this is uh, the location of the project. This is an assemblage of four parcels, which are abutted by uh, scrub it up car wash to the rear, Boston Street along the main facade, as well as Boston Street Extension and West Howell Street. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a uh, developmental uh, development aerial uh, showing how this uh, project aims to transition between the uh, mostly three-story, three-family uh, neighborhood across the street into the South Bay Plaza and the Yonkarski Way developments that we've seen. Um, next slide, please. So just from context of what's there existing now, uh, it's mostly comprised of uh, one and two-story light fabrication industrial uses. Uh, so the, as more importantly, this is a uh, sort of pedestrian wasteland along the front of this parcel. So our, our goal is to activate the streetscape, provide a much more friendly environment for folks in the neighborhood and residents of the building as they traverse from this portion of Boston Street to South Bay Plaza and beyond. Uh, next slide. So further uh, off what I just mentioned, uh, we are creating a connection between Boston Street at the bottom of the screen uh, through what we've created, a, a small pocket park um, that brings uh, pedestrians by the residential and commercial space, connects along to West Howell Street. As was previously mentioned, we're also looking at extending the sidewalk around uh, Boston Street. There's an existing triple decker on the left corner there. We'll be connecting that uh, sidewalk as well so that we will have a full uh, pedestrian experience here along with new street trees, blue bike stations, and plantings and wayfinding signage. Uh, I do want to point out that through extensive uh, community involvement, we, we heard a lot of the uh, concerns regarding scrub it up um, car wash and some of the queuing that's involved in that. So as part of this project, we're proposing to work with scrub it up in a redevelopment of their site to allow for all queue for upwards of 40 vehicles to be queued on site. And we'll be granting them uh, an eas easement for that, which you can see at the top of the screen. Next slide, please. So as part of uh, our involvement and in, in, uh, discussions with BPDA, it was determined that as opposed to a singular structure, we'd like to go with two, two distinct buildings that are connected by a ground level connection. Uh, this allows um, a nice uh, community space for both buildings to be on the elevated second floor terrace, which you can see here, which can be activated with a number of programs. Uh, yoga, uh, outdoor dining, et cetera, just general congregation. Uh, this also provides a little bit more breathing room to the existing neighbors uh, across the street and, and maintains a view corridor to the city beyond. Next slide, please. So this is a view from Boston Street looking up at the building. And I just like to point out that we, one of the things that we heard and we tried to react to was stepping the building back from the street, as well as stepping the buildings away from each other as they, um, intersect at the common courtyard. Uh, you can see the ground level uh, commercial space all along the ground floor. I will point out that this has been slated to be uh, CrossFit Southeast's new location. So they will be taking this entire space. So it's great to already have a tenant in place. Um, and as well as this new pocket park you can see in the foreground, uh, which will be the, to the benefit of all. Uh, next slide. Again, here's sort of just an elevated view of what we we're just talking about. Um, you can see the uh, common green space on the second floor, as well as this new pocket park below. And uh, we tried to treat the buildings as two separate buildings, but have some common design themes that tie the two together as far as materials uh, and the stepping of, of balconies and uh, the mass as a whole. So I just point out that in general, this is a five-story building, but you can see on the right here that that is a six-floor lounge for residents, as well as a common roof deck on the back side, away from the residents in the existing Dorchester neighborhood, looking towards the city beyond. Um, next slide. 
Yes, so with that, I will uh, turn it back to the board for any questions, comments, or thoughts. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, questions or comments from the board? Yeah, it looks, looks, looks really cool. I love a pocket park. <laughs> um, and, and creating that outdoor space, um, you know, whether it's you know, floating in the air uh, on, on top of that, uh, uh, that section in between the buildings or you know, on the ground. Uh, so, cool. Uh, a motion uh, is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Good luck. And uh, I think you're going to make a lot of CrossFitters happy. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Item number 23. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Zoning Code, for the proposed constructions of a mixed-use development consisting of 3,265 gross square units Wait, no, gross square feet of ground retail, 48 residential rental units, uh, including six IVP units, nine car parking spaces, and 52 bicycle parking spaces, located at uh, 749 through 759 Dudley Street and to Virginia Street, and to take all related actions. Ebony. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Johnson. My name is Ebony DeRosa, and I'm a Senior Project Manager in the Development Review Department. We are here before you today to discuss the 749 to 759 Dudley Street Small Project. I thank you for your time today. The proposed project consists of the construction of a new six-story, approximately 49,084 gross square foot building with up to 48 rental units, nine parking spaces, and ground floor retail space. The small project review application was filed on November 30th, 2023, and a public meeting was held in January. After the public meeting, the proponent continued their community outreach and met with approximately nine community groups. The proponent also connected with Councilor Fitzgerald, who ultimately submitted a letter of support for the project. At this time, I am happy to turn it over to Michelle Yee from the planning team to discuss the planning context for the project, followed by a presentation from the development team. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony. Um, good evening, Chair OS, Secretary Williams, members of the board, and Director Jamison. My name is Michelle Yee, and I am the BBDA Zoning Compliance Planner assigned to this project. Um, next slide, please. The proposed project at 749 to 759 Dudley Street is located in the Dorchester Neighborhood District within the Neighborhood Shopping Subdistrict. It is also within the boundaries of the Fairmont Indigo Planning Initiative Uphams Corner Station Area Plan, which was adopted by the BRA Board in October 2015. In regards to transportation, the proposed project is served by the Uphams Corner Commuter Rail Station and multiple MBTA bus lines. Uh, next slide, please. The Uphams Corner Station Area Plan established a framework for future improvements and investments to enhance the commercial center of Uphams Corner. The goals of the planning initiatives, initiative included straightening the local business activity and creating residential uses above with above ground, or sorry, <laughs> creating residential uses above active ground floor uses. Next slide, please. While zoning recommendations from the Uphams Corner Station Area Plan were not formally adopt adopted, relief is recommended for the proposed project. The proposed use mix is consistent with the goals of the Uphams Corner Station Area Plan. In regards to transportation and the public ground improvements, the sidewalk would be expanded to meet complete street guidelines. To comply with the bike parking guidelines, 52 interior bike parking spaces will be provided. The development team will also construct a bump out on Ramsey Street to make the nearby seasonal bike share station accessible year round. Pending board approval and subsequent zoning board of appeal approval of the required zoning relief, the proposed project would undergo further design review at the BPDA. And thank you, and now I'll turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. Um, first of all, uh, my name is uh, Doug Stefanov, Stefanov Architects, here on behalf of the owner, Mark and Stuart Salzberg of the Salzberg family. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, Chair Roas, members of the board, and Director Jameson for this time. Uh, we 
bring to you or propose a 48 unit uh, mixed use building on the corner of Dudley and Virginia Street on this uh, commercial uh, section of uh, Dudley. Um, it is a um, six story uh, building, uh, primarily residential, with a mix of uh, one, two, three, and studio units, 3,500 square feet of commercial space on the first floor, and of course, uh, bike, bike parking and uh, vehicle parking at the back off Virginia. Next slide, please. Uh, there's some context. The building uh, existing is a rainbow single story masonry retail shop. Uh, this is a, a tenant at will. Um, it will continue to be a retail space. Uh, we don't have any potential or future tenants as of yet, but the street's uh, quite active and uh, look forward to a future tenant. Next slide, please. Uh, just a general gross area of the building, it, six stories high. Um, as I mentioned, residential for the most of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the uh, six uh, IDP units uh, scattered uh, throughout the building on uh, different floors and different locations and uh, different configurations, um, as well as uh, they would have common access to the building amenities. Next slide, please. Uh, first floor commercial. Uh, Virginia's got a slight grade uh, change, so the parking is actually elevated. That's one way coming down Virginia. Uh, the nine parking spaces and parking aisle access uh, from Virginia, and then uh, all the commercial space on Dudley. Next slide, please. Uh, parking, which we just discussed. Uh, next slide, please. A typical uh, floor, uh, center uh, elevators uh, surrounded by uh, residential units to try to maximize uh, light and air. We're uh, blessed with having two streets um, and um, a southerly exposure on the back of the building, so, and a two-story building to our, our left. So uh, this is very fortunate for um, fresh air and light for all the residents. Next slide, please. Uh, typical uh, floor plan going up. Next slide, please. You can proceed. Next. And next. Next. Uh, the roof, we propose a common uh, landscaped um, roof deck uh, for the tenants. This would be pulled back from the edges. so. It's relatively invisible. Um, I should mention we are proposing new street trees at the first floor, landscaping, some shrubbery as well, and we'd landscape the roof as well. Uh, next slide, please. Elevations of the building. I've been working uh, with uh, June at uh, BPDA on articulating the, the streetscape commercial to pick up some of the other historic components of the, of the other commercial buildings on the street, be brick uh, for the first floor and terracotta uh, on the bulk of the building and the metal standing seam top for a three-part uh, building. Next slide, please. And just the back and the party wall side with some perspectives showing uh, the change in materials, which we think would be nice to be light in, in color. Um, that's uh, in our street trees. Next slide. Um, it slides a little off, but uh, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, well, thank you. Great. Um, uh, any questions or comments from the board? Um, I um, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a great uh, a great building. I also like that there's some some three bedrooms in there too. So yeah. uh, you know, again, good to see. Um, housing of all different uh, different sizes. So thank you. Uh, with that, um, uh, I have a quick question. question. Oh, your question. Yeah, uh, I, I see the proximity um, to the commuter rail, but with the nine parking spots, how does that get determined? Like, like who, who gets first preference or things like I know you might not get there yet. Yeah, that, it's true. It's a little early. They would be earmarked for the residents and uh, they'd probably be a lottery. I mean, this is a rental building, so uh, residents would have uh, obviously 
there'd be a de uh, demand for that. It would be up to the building management to assign the parking spaces. We do have, of course, our accessible parking spaces in there as well, and uh, the van uh, access for those who might be handicapped. And then the, uh, the commercial wrenches on the bottom floor, I think it was Rainbows. I know they're uh, at will, but that's it, just... Well, they're welcome to come back. I mean, that's um, the uh, the family owns the building on the other side of Virginia Street as well. So they manage um, school uniforms. They sell their lead, one of the leading suppliers of school uniforms actually in the state as well as, well as the city. Um, they're welcome to return. It's not like, but obviously for construction, it takes a little time to build. Marcos, thank you very much. Of course, thank you, sir. Um, additional questions or comments? Right, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, great presentation, thank you and good luck. Thank you all very much. Cheers. Okay, item number 24. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed construction of 21 fully affordable residential home ownership units and four car parking spaces located at 2 Hillsborough Street and to execute and deliver a community benefits agreement and to take all related actions. Come on. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board, Secretary Paul Hemus and Director Jemison. My name is Camille Platt. I'm a project manager within Development Review and the proposal before you is for an Article 80 small project at 2 Hillsborough Street in Dorchester. The proposed project includes the new construction of 21 for sale condominium units in a single four story building. The proposed project's home ownership units will be affordable to households earning 80% AMI and 100% AMI and will include six studio units, three one bedroom units, 11 two bedroom units, and one three bedroom unit. 18 of the 21 units will have a preference for Boston certified artists. There will be four parking spaces and 26 long term bicycle parking spaces on site. The BBDA held a virtual public meeting for this project on October 24th, 2023, along with the proponent hosting community meetings. The meeting was well attended and was advertised in both the local newspaper and online. I will now turn it over to Ford Del Vecchio from the BPDA zoning compliance team to discuss planning context that was considered in the review of this project before the development team begins their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Uh Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polimus, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Ford Del Vecchio, and I'm the BPDA Zoning Compliance Reviewer assigned to this project. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Two Hillsborough Street is located on the edge of the Uffman's Corner Commercial Node, an area characterized by a variety of building types, including single-family, multifamily, and mixed-use commercial and residential developments. The proposed project is located three blocks from MBTA bus stops for the 15 and 41 bus lines. In addition, the Uptons Corner commuter rail station is within a quarter mile walk, and the JFK UMass Red Line stop is a three quarter mile walk down the Columbia Road to the east. The western edge of the property faces the rear of the Humphrey Street Studios, an adopted former industrial site used as an artist workspace that provides space to creators throughout the Boston community to both construct and present their art. The focus on the arts is reflected in the new development at 2 Hillsborough Street, as 18 of the 21 units will have a lottery preference for certified artists. The proponent was also involved in the preservation of artist workspace at the Humphrey Street Studios. Next slide, please. The proposed project is within the study area of the Uppings Corner Station Area Plan, adopted by the BRA Board in 2015, a product of the Fairmont Indigo Corridor Plan. While the zoning recommendations and public realm goals of the, goals of the Uppings Corner Plan were not formalized through zoning, the goals of this planning process are still relevant to the site. These goals include the following, minimizing displacement of existing residents and businesses, strengthening local business activity, creating transit-oriented housing, and locating residential uses above ground floor retail to provide a stable customer base. Uppham's Corner is identified as an arts and innovation district where economic development is anchored by cultural uses. Artist housing, venues for the creative economy, and public realm enhancements are necessary to fulfill this vision, in part through pu strong public-private partnerships. The proposed project fulfills these objectives by constructing live work space for artists. By creating housing for artists in the neighborhood, this project helps to create a hub for the creative econ economy that the arts and innovation district seeks to achieve. 
Thank you, and I will now turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. Thank you, Ford, and thank you, Camille. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jameson. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I am Brian Goldson with New Atlantic Development. Um, and I just want to tell you a little about this. To Hillsboro, it's an, it's an offshoot of the Humphrey Street Studios located just to the east of the site. Um, after many years, that building was in danger of being lost to market rate development. We were able to work with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the artists at Humphreys to form a nonprofit, secure financing, and help them purchase their building in October of 2022. With funding provided by the city and private sources, we were able to preserve the affordable studio space in perpetuity for a diverse group of long-term tenants a total of 45 spaces providing affordable workspace for artists, including painters, photographers, sculptors, woodworkers, graphic artists, mixed media artists, a blacksmith, architects, and many others, many of whom also operate small businesses on the property, providing employment opportunities in addition to their art. The preservation of Humphrey Street Studios really is a success story, not only for the arts community, but also for the city as a whole. That acquisition was also included in that acquisition was also an 11,000 square foot vacant lot just behind the Humphrey Street Studios. It's located at the end of Hillsborough Street, right next to the Indigo Block. And we worked with the artist at Humphreys, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Mayor's Office of Housing to create a program of condos that range from three bedrooms down to studios. Like Ford said, 18 of them are set aside for live work units with a preference for artists. And in, in addition to the live work units, the buildings, the building also has a display space and common area and a gallery at the ground floor and a workspace at the lower level to really expand the range of artists that could be served well by this building. The building is Passive House certified or will be press, Passive House certified is 100% electric, uh, zero emission will have an array of photovoltaic panels up on the roof. And we feel that this program really meshes well with the adjacent Humphrey Street Studios and complements that use as well. I'm going to turn it over to Kendra Halliwell with uh, Icon Architecture to tell you about the design. Great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Camille. And thanks, Ford. I don't want to repeat what each of you have already said. Um, but this is, this is an underutilized site at a dead end. I think, could we go to the next slide? Great. So we talked a little bit about the context. There is the neighborhood fabric of triple deckers. The side abuts up against the Humphrey Street Studios. So there's an industrial flavor and adjacency that we're drawing from in the design here. Next slide. So our site is a dead end. Um, we're proposing four parking spaces. One is then accessible. Uh, we're looking to increase the landscaping and improve access around the full site, including to the rear of the Humphrey Street Studio. We're looking to create a vibrant corner of this community. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, we're also including bike parking, of course, for the residents as well as visitors. We're looking for opportunities for the artists to use that outdoor space. Brian mentioned there's, uh, we're, we're looking to create an artist gallery space on the ground floor and in the lobby. There's additional workspace in the lower level of the building. Could we go to the next slide, please? So those common spaces are shown here on the plan in, the, in lavender. The lobby there at the lower, uh, lower right-hand corner and the lower level uh, workspace there at the top right. We're including a mix of unit sizes. There are six studios, three one bedrooms, 11 two bedrooms, and one three bedroom unit for a total of 21. And they range in size from just under 600 square feet up to um, a little over 850 square feet. The building will be LEED certifiable, all electric and passive house certified, and include rooftop solar panels for common space use. So we've created a really efficient floor plate here uh, in order to also create a, uh, an insulated airtight envelope that'll set the future owners up, future owners up to, for minimized utility bills. Uh, the artist spaces, uh, interiors, the artist features are include a broad corridor inside. We've got an oversized elevator 
we've included wide doors where we can, as well as our work sink in that basement workspace. Next slide. And this shows the relationship of the, the common spaces shown in lavender. Next slide. The exterior of the building draws from the nearby industrial and artist uses. We propose a ribbed metal cladding in two color palettes that's applied in a pattern that's based on an interpretation of the adjacent artist building fenestration. The main entry is located closest to the corner, closest to the street, which will be highlighted with warm tones and a canopy. We're looking to incorporate playful accents and hopefully incorporate some of the artist's work into the building and facade and site. Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Just uh, so many elements of this project, which are great, affordable home ownership, all electric, passive house, artist housing. Um, it's a great project. Thank you for the presentation. Awesome. OK, additional questions or comments? All right, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. Approved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, congratulations and, and thank you uh, for, um, yeah, just contributing a really great building and, uh, and maintaining our community, our artist community there and enhancing that, so, um, you know, very excited that, that you guys were able to form, uh, you know, form the um, whatever entity that you formed um, to to get this done. Uh, so uh, kudos and, and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's okay. Um, at number twenty five, request authorization to issue a certification of approval pursuant to Article eighty E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the proposed renovation and construction of 95 residential rental units, including 19 IDP units located at 85 Devonshire Street in the downtown and wharf district neighborhood, and to execute and deliver an affordable rental housing agreement and restriction in connection with the proposed project, and to authorize the director to execute a quick claim deed to take a real property interest in the 85 Devonshire Street property and enter into a pilot agreement for the proposed project and take all related actions. So, Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Jamison and Secretary Bolhemus. My name is Zoe Schutte and I'm a BPDA Project Assistant in Development Review. I am here before you to present the proposed Article 80E small project located at 85 Devonshire Street in the downtown neighborhood of Boston and the proposed 121B agreement to effectuate the project's qualification for the downtown residential conversion incentive pilot program. The proposed project contemplates the interior renovation of the existing 11-story, approximately 109,400 gross square foot building that has been divided into two legal condominium units, one containing the 10 upper floors of underused office space and the other containing the currently occupied ground floor retail tenants and basement mechanical space. The upper 10 floors of 85 Devonshire Street will be converted from office space to residential use, totaling 95 residential rental units and 86,700 gross square feet. The proposed project will also include an interior, sub, interior subsurface bicycle storage room with 28 bicycle spaces. The ground floor retail space of the proposed project will remain untouched and currently includes approximately 15,800 square feet of retail space. The existing exterior of 85 Devonshire will remain unchanged, maintaining the historical aesthetics of the building. Next slide, please. On December 14th, 2023, KS Partners applied to Mayor Wu's and the BPDA Downtown Residential Conversion Incentive Pilot Program. The pilot program was authorized by the BPDA Board on October 12th, 2023, and offers approved applicants a tax abatement in exchange for converting their underutilized office building into multifamily residential rental units pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 121B. This marks the second downtown residential conversion project to be presented to the Board for approval following the same terms and conditions as the first project of its kind that received BPDA Board approval at the March Board. Thank <laughs> you. 
If approved, the proponent will enter into a pilot agreement among the City of Boston and the BPDA and a subsequent deed agreement under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 121B, Section 16. The proposed project is located in the general business subdistrict of the Boston Proper Zoning District and under Section 13-3, the building itself and existing dimensional configuration is grandfathered and allowed to be altered. The proposed residential use is allowed under per Article 8, Table A. The proponent will be requesting relief from the Zoning Board of Appeal for the usable open space requirements of Section 13-4. On December 14th, 2023, the BPDA received a small project review application from the proponent. The BPDA hosted a virtual public meeting on March 12th, 2024, which was well attended and well received. The public meeting was advertised in the local newspapers and a notice was posted on the BPDA's calendar. The comment period ended on March 21st, 2024. I am also joined here today by John Weil, BPDA Senior Program Manager for Downtown Conversions. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to John Polgini from the development team to present the project. Thank you, Zoe. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Polanas. Uh, I'm John Polgini, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to present this project, this office, to residential conversion project for you this evening. With me is Kambi Shabazi, the president and founder of KS Partners, Tom Greenfield, Todd Greenfield, the director of development of KS Partners, and Cindy Lee from Embark Architects. I would like to take a minute to also thank Zoe, John Weil, and Matt Dunham for all their assistance in moving this proposal forward. Their involvement with and dedication to this project was crucial in making this possible. Who among us could have predicted in March of 2020, our world experienced a pandemic that not only caused the death of over a million Americans and neg negatively impacted the social and mental health of our children, but also changed the way America does business. I guess none of us have predicted it. However, the reality of it can be seen every day in the declining demand for office space due to the increased utilization of the remote work format. Luckily, provided the building is laid out correctly, these struggling buildings can absorb and, and contribute to the critical need of housing in this city. 85 Devonshire will do just that, providing 95 residential units of housing, 19 of which will be income restricted. This adaptive reuse not only provides, mu provides much needed housing, but also will contribute a significant boost to our struggling downtown businesses by providing a much needed influx of potential customers. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Cindy Lee to walk through the proposal. Thanks again. Thank you, John. Thank you, Zoe. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairman, member of the board, Director Jameson, and uh, Secretary Ohamis. My name is Cindy Lee with Embark with a project architect for 85 Devonshire. Um, next slide, please. So the site, as you well know, is white smack in the downtown Boston area with uh, excellent access to public transportation as well as open space. Um, just a short walk to the Boston Common on one direction and um, in the other direction to the Greenway. Next, please. The proposed project consists of three uh, adjoining buildings that forms the three-sided uh, lot. Um, we begin with um, 85 Devonshire, which you see on the right-hand side, and to the west of that um, is 262 Washington Street, um, and also 258 Washington Street. Uh, the three buildings are uh, handsome uh, examples of turn of century architecture, um, with 262 Washington Street being built in um, 1901, uh, Washington in 1908, and uh, the small 258 Washington Street um, just a couple years after. Um, it is situated adjacent to one Devonshire uh, place, which is a, a apartment building, luxury apartment building, and across the street from the Pie Alley parking garage. Um, next, please. As it was stated, um, all of the uh, ground floor retail spaces are occupied and they will continue to uh, be uh, in service while the conversion takes place. Next, please. 
Uh, here you, you see two uh, ground floor plans where those retail spaces are because um, the elevation change from Devonshire to Washington. Uh, we will be utilizing the 85 Devonshire uh, existing lobby as the new residential lobby. Uh, the 262 um, lobby uh, on Washington Street will be the second means of egress for the uh, residential portion of the conversion. Next, please. Uh, as the, the 95 um, units that we're converting will be from floor 2 to 11. This is a section through 85 Devonshire on your right and uh, 262 Washington on your left. Um, with the three-sided site, we're really able to take advantage of the windows, the existing historic windows, uh, to build these, uh, to lay out these apartments around. There is a, a bit of uh, a challenge with um, none of the floors aligned between the three buildings, so we um, are creating uh, accessible transfer floors. Um, both Washington Street and Devonshire have their individual elevator course, so um, getting up to each floor is not an issue, it's just crossing through the floors. Uh, next, please. And this is just another illustration showing how the, the floor between even 262 and 258 um, don't align, um, but we're um, able to still utilize it uh, to lay out the units. Next, please. On the exterior, um, the building is actually in uh, excellent shape, so uh, there would be uh, minimal change uh, to the exterior. Um, this is an elevation on Water Street with 85 Devonshire on your right and Washington Street uh, 262 on your left. Um, next, please. Similarly, on the uh, Washington Street elevation, is really just um, keeping uh, the, the uh, maybe doing some cleaning and then there's isolated windows that we need to replace um, as they were original but otherwise uh, no change to uh, the exterior next please um, i like to add that i'm really excited about um, bringing housing to um, to downtown more housing to downtown boston but also um, in convert, converting these buildings, we're bringing new life to these old buildings and, and the ability to um, have they have them service, um, have a, a longer useful life, service life. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Cindy. Um, okay, questions or comments from the board? Uh, again, I'm just sorry about that, but I'm just happy to see another conversion. Uh, this one's a, on a larger scale than the previous one, and um, I just you know can't wait to see how these turn out, and hopefully we can get more foot traffic in the downtown Boston area. So, thank you, thank you and your team for everything you've done. Yeah, great. Um, plus one on yeah, plus, plus one on that. Thank you for taking uh, responding to the call <laughs> uh, that we put out there to uh, you know to reimagine and to recognize that uh, so many of our buildings in the downtown area have plenty of life left. It may be a little bit of a different use, but um, you know I think it's just a great way for us to still retain that character, right, and have that balance and history and. Um, they're just really cool, um, cool buildings uh, that I'm glad that we're keeping. So, uh, with that, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett. Aye. Uh, Mr. Mr. Shepard. I'm not a doctor yet. I know. I was like, I almost made you a doctor. <laughs> I was like, I was like <laughs> but Mr. Shepard. You gave me an eye, right? I did give you an eye. Uh, okay, I was too busy laughing. Um, okay, and the chair votes aye. So motion passes. Uh, congratulations, good luck. Um, and uh, yeah, see you Thank later. You. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Um, sorry, it's just get a little loopy towards the end of the meeting, so let me just refocus here. Um, okay, item number 26. 
Um, request authorization for the approval of the agreement for affordable housing contribution between the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency and uh, 3305 uh, through 3309 Washington LLC in lieu of the creation of a single unit of income restricted housing. Ruben. Oh, wait, wait. Is there not, there's no presentation with us? There's no presentation. Okay, no presentation, yeah. <laughs> it says it in bold right there, huh? Um, okay, so, <laughs> um, so with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number 27, request all the Authorization to issue a determination waiving further review pursuant to Article 80A-6 of the Zoning Code for the notice of project change for the 267 Old Colony Avenue project filed with the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency on February 21st, 2024 to convert 55 residential rental units to 55 home ownership units and execute an affordable housing agreement to replace uh, and to do that right? to convert, execute affordable housing agreement to replace and supersede the affordable rental, oh my God, my same, the same thing over again, to supersede the affordable rental housing agreement and restriction, uh, executed on September 9th, 2022, by and between the Boston Planning and Development Agency and 267 Old Colony LLC and to take all related actions. Ebony. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. My name is Evan DeRosa, and I'm a Senior Project Manager in the Development Review Department. We are here before you today to discuss the proposed 267 Old Colony Avenue Notice of Project Change. I thank you for your time today. The previously approved project consisted of a six-story, approximately 74,570-square-foot building, which contained 55 rental units, commercial space, and ground, and garage parking for approximately 65 spaces, which is currently under construction. The notice of project change will include the conversion of the 55 rental units to 55 home ownership units with no other changes. The notice of project change was filed on February 21st. A joint IAG and public meeting was held in March, and the comment period ended on March 22nd. Before I hand it over to the development team, I would like to acknowledge a letter of support from Councilor um, Flynn, which came in earlier today. At this time, I am happy to turn it over to the development team for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony. Uh, good, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Kalimas and Director Jemison. My name is George Morancy. I'm an attorney. I represent the developer in this matter. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, as Ebony said, this is a notice of project change simply to effectuate a change of the project from rental apartment units to condominium units for sale. There are 55 units in the building. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is the project site. This is located uh, about 1,000 feet uh, northeast of Andrew Square, which is visible on the map to the left. Next slide, please. This is um, uh, in uh, elevation along Old Colony Avenue of the building. Next slide, please. This is at Dorchester Street elevation. Next slide, please. Rear elevation. Next slide, please and side elevation with the garage entrance off of Old Colony Avenue. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of what the building will look like when complete. The building is under construction. It is substantially complete. Uh, construction completion is estimated in August of this year. And that concludes the presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any comments from board members. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Okay, yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, rental to ownership, okay. Uh, so with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, item number 28. Request authorization to approve a 
a project alteration pursuant to code 80A-6, the zoning code, for the conversion of five IDP rental units located at 575 Albany Street to home ownership units and execute an affordable housing agreement for a combination of on-site units and contribution to the IDP fund and to take all related actions. No, uh, no PowerPoint, correct? Correct. Okay, yeah, this is just- But, so but Nick does have some comments. Oh, Nick does have comments. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, so you have comments but no slides. Yes. Okay, Nick. Comment. Thank you, Madam Chair, members <laughs> of the board, Secretary of Holiness, and Director Jemison. Uh, the proposal before you is a project alteration proposing the conversion of five IDP rental units located at 575 Albany Street in the South End to home ownership units and to execute an affordable housing agreement for a combination of on-site units and contributions to the IDP fund. Um, as you all remember, last month we passed a new uh, notice of project change standard operating procedure and this is the first project to come forward under that new policy. Um, and as that new policy states, this is not a notice of project change, rather administrative uh, project alteration. Uh, the project was originally proposed as 50 rental units and now has changed to 50 home ownership units. In doing so, the original five IDP rental units must be converted to five IDP home ownership units. And with this change, an additional corresponding payment in lieu of units for an additional 10% must be contributed to the IDP fund for approximately $1.5 million. Uh, lastly, the BPDA reached out to the local elected officials to notify them of this alteration and all were in support. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. And uh, as previously stated, there is no presentation along with this. Okay, great. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Nick. And we did 29.30 already. So item number 31, request authorization for the disbursement of $125,000 to the University of Massachusetts Boston's Department of Urban Planning in support of the 2024 summer program expanding Boston's pipeline for youth of color in urban planning. Lease. Good evening and thank you, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Paulinus and Director Jemison. My name is Luis Frias. I'm the director of DEI here at the BPDA. I'm here to speak to you about the UMass program. It's a very long title, so I'm just going to call it the UMass program for now, if that's all right. Um, this initiative was born from a call for programs issued in, by the Office of DEI in 2021, seeking proposals from Boston's institutions of higher education for programs focused on increasing the diversity of the fields of urban planning, design, and development. The idea was to create engaging experiential learning opportunities for local youth of color to help them see the importance of bringing their voices and perspectives to these fields. Since the first iteration of the program, we've seen it grow from one cohort of 15 students to two cohorts totaling 27 students of color from six BPS uh, locations in Roxbury and Dorchester. Uh, they've expanded their curriculum from a single year to a multi-year program for uh, the multiple cohorts that are returning. Um, these feature multiple uh, paid internship placements, peer mentoring opportunities, uh, foundational and advanced classes focused on community planning, urban resiliency, ecological planning and design. No cost access to a three credit university class that examines the origins, evolution, and current state of urban planning, design, and development in Boston. They also established an after school club for some wraparound support during the school year that focuses on social justice in Boston. And the program has published two reports exploring extreme heat challenges and solutions in Lower Roxbury. Also notably, they're the first and so far the only program for high school students that received the American Planning Association's Best Student Project Award, which recognized the students' work on that 2022 report. Uh, this team is not one to rest on their laurels. They are, uh, this team behind the proposed 2024 program seeks to further increase the impact by increasing the number of schools being represented from six to eight schools, increasing the number of participating students uh, from 27 between those two, horse, two cohorts to 40, um, expanding the number of paid student internships as well to the full 27 for those first two cohorts that came through um, and extending that internship period from one month to two months throughout the summer. Um, they're also expanding that uh, college credit program to now be a dual enrollment program where they'll be able to take 12 students per semester um, to enroll in up to six transferable credits at no cost to them. They'll have full financial support from the program as well. Um, they're also looking to provide health and counseling support through the uh, their, uh, Department of Nursing 
think they're expanding their after school enrichment program to feature more workshops, speakers, uh, more professional development opportunities. Um, they're building a website where they're going to host a whole bunch of information over their activities over the past couple years and also feature information for other schools that might be looking to replicate this program as well. Um, and last but not least, um, they also are working with uh, Dr. Heather Zakowski from the Department of Leadership Education, the Department of Leadership in Education at UMass Boston for a really rigorous, comprehensive program evaluation, which will include a participatory action research study as well, so they can get real time feedback and adjust the, uh, I guess, with real time course corrections throughout the program year. Um, now, I also want to acknowledge, you may have noticed that last month's board, we also had this on the agenda and we ended up having to pull it at the last second. Um, there are two things that kind of happened to cause that. Um, first, uh, Dr. Ken Reardon, who has served as the leader of this program since its inception, uh, has officially begun his well-deserved, well-earned retirement. Um, so there was a transfer of leadership in that. And also, the program had received uh, uh, information from an extensive evaluation that was conducted by some graduate students in their urban planning graduate program um, that they were able to kind of make some adjustments to the programming then. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to reflect a lot of those changes as well. Um, Dr. Ken Reardon has left the program in the brilliant and capable hands of Dr. Samia Balachandran, who began supporting the program last year, so she is very well acquainted with the program. And she brings uh, an incredible expertise in social justice, housing policy, affordable housing development, and community development, amongst other things that will really have a huge impact on these students. And um, through the different meetings we've had with her over the last couple of months, I have to say I'm very excited about her vision for ways to really grow the program in future years as well. Um, with that being said, I'd just like to say thank you for your time and consideration and more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Um, I guess I just wanna say like, just like, yay, I have like, <laughs> Obviously, had the privilege of, of seeing this program start, you know, uh, you know, several years back, and and to see it grow every year is just a, uh, it's really really inspiring, and uh, and to see that growth with the wraparound services and how it's like after school program, just um, what uh, you know what a program like this can can create, uh, and the ripple effects I think uh, are going to be. Um, Pretty amazing. So um, with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Louise, good luck. Let us know if we can support you guys in any way. Um, and, Absolutely, uh, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, item number 32, personnel, Mike. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. We have a number of items for your consideration on the BRA agenda with the exact details included in the board memos. We have six appointments in the Communications Department, Joe Neil Casado, Community Engagement Manager, Spanish Language. In the Real Estate Department, we have Walter Hyde, Senior Commercial Leasing Manager. In the Finance Department, we have Kristen Treese and Audrey Hart Procurement. Uh, specialist, sorry, procurement specialist, and in the urban uh, design department, Ernan Schlossman, senior urban designer two, and Eric Boatwright, senior architect two. We also have one out of state travel request. And that's it. Thank you very much. And take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thanks, Mike. Okay, item number 33, contractual. I need a motion to pay the bills. Motion to pay the bills. Second. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion passes. Please pay the bills. And finally, Item number 34, our director's update. Director Jemison, uh, the floor is yours. 
Hi, good evening, board members and, uh, and all listening audience. Um, thanks so much for uh, joining tonight. So um, at tonight's board meeting, we approved five new development projects representing over 254 total residential units and 161 total income restricted units. Uh, the total developer's cost estimate uh, was $820 million. Uh, and this represents approximately 1.9 million square feet of new development for the city. Uh, so it was a, uh, another big uh, month of approvals. Um, when constructed, we'll put to, to, to work 1,650 tradespeople uh, and create 4,000 direct jobs and 829 indirect jobs. Um, just a few highlights from the agenda, which is full of uh, a wide range of exciting um, movement. Specifically, uh, the designation of the uh, water and sewer parcels uh, was a major uh, step forward. The proposal responds effectively to our RFP. It also aligns with the strategic uh, master plan for Roxbury as well as Plan Nubian. Um, it's going to be a great addition to our housing stock. We had two great proposals uh, from uh, very strong teams. It was a uh, tough decision. Uh, but I'd like to thank our staff for working uh, closely with the neighborhood um, to review the projects and we're looking forward to working with the selected related Beal and Dream development team on the project. Um, 290 North Beacon is another place where there was exciting action to, tonight. Um, acquiring a property uh, on North Beacon Street uh, that's going to be part of a community benefits agreement uh, that's enabling 155 North Beacon Street to go forward. Um, the space is meant to be used per, as a permanently affordable arts and culture space in Austin Brighton. It's an unprecedented community benefit that we're thrilled to have secured um, for Austin Brighton as part of our effort to mitigate displacement there. Well, many partners uh, were involved in getting this to happen. I want to highlight IQHQ and their contribution, uh, as well as the par our partners uh, over at MOAC or the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture uh, making this happen, and of course, the real estate staff here at the agency. Um, Mattapan um, Squares and Streets uh, designation this month is also a major move in planning. Uh, it's the first neighborhood in the city where the zoning will take effect. Uh, and it's the implementation of the plan Mattapan recommendations, bringing together the, um, the planning effort that had been launched, uh, connecting it to the planning work we're doing uh, uh, through the vision that the, the mayor's outlined. So we're very excited about that. I want to thank our staff and Mattapan residents for their attention and dedication uh, to this matter. Um, last call, couple of items. Um, today we had another um, approval uh, for an office to residential conversion. It's the second one, um, and tonight we approved the uh, the pilot um, that uh, uh, approved the pilot project. Uh, this is an underutilized office building. It's going to be turned into 95 new homes, 19 of which will be income restricted, uh, just across the street, really from City Hall on Devonshire Street. Um, this conversion uh, advances key recommendations of our downtown revitalization report and plan downtown. We look forward to working uh, on other projects that have applied in this program in the same way. I'd like to give a shout out to the team uh, led by John Weil and, of course, uh, Pratap Petros, uh, who's been working very hard to get this program um, to work in the, in the truncated approval times, which is one of the reasons that we've got the projects uh, so quickly after coming in the door, uh, coming to the board. So. Um, We've got another 100 or so units in the pipeline, uh, and we're really excited about what we're seeing. Um, last couple of notes would be, have to do with core on the dot, uh, phase B, um, you know, uh, and, and a few other um, important projects. With the approval of the first phase of on the dot, uh, we're advancing key recommendations from Plan South Boston, Dorchester Ave, uh, and Plan South Boston, uh, Dorchester Avenue Transportation Planning Study. Um, these three projects, uh, Core on the Dot, Phase 1B, 505 to Dorchester Avenue, and 65 Ellery Street, sorry, 65 to 75 Ellery Street, um, are advancing those uh, priorities. It's an exciting first step in the area of South Boston that's really uh, going to be quite changed when uh, the full vision is realized. Um, finally, uh, on Two Hillsborough Street, I want to acknowledge a new project we approved tonight um, behind uh, in, in Up Homes Corner, uh, which is going to convert vacant land into 21 new income restricted homes, 18 of which are specifically designated for artist live workspace. Up Homes Corner has been identified as an arts and innovation district, and projects like these are necessary to fulfill the vision. I want to thank the internal team and, of course, the development 
uh, proponent uh, for the hard work. Um, another great agenda tonight representing the full range of uh, kinds of development uh, that our city needs. Uh, everything from downtown office conversion to uh, land audit success, uh, a real, uh, a real uh, agenda to be proud of. I want to thank the board for their attention tonight and of course all the staff and development interests who uh, are building Boston every month. Um, passing it back to you, Chair. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, thanks, Jack, Director Jemison. And and, um, uh, and I agree. Fabulous meeting. So many exciting things. Great job uh, to you for your leadership and, uh, and to the team for this hard work. I'm just loving it. But, you know, it's, it's about time we end this meeting, I think. <laughs> We're all done for tonight. So with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. And Priscilla, we'll thanks for doing this from Europe. That was amazing. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I know. We finished before 2 a.m., right? It's 1.40.